All right, the recording is set. Um, Maria, I have to apologize because last episode I had a whole section on shipping and neglected to invite a Black Sun shipper. Oh, it's it's cool. Okay, I hope we you you we we uh, did it justice as best we could. Yeah, and it doesn't really get. I mean, I feel like the real Black Sun hours are like volume four and five. So. That is true. Yeah. That's where you get a lot of the material. I also think the one thing that I, I regret not mentioning in the last one is I feel like a lot of the impetus for that ship is that just, like, sun is hot. Yeah. <laughs> also, and, same semblance. I don't know if anyone mentioned that. But. Oh, that's true, because they both have shadow clones. Yeah. They both have shadow clone no jutsu. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's valid. I feel like, because it's like, what percentage of shipping is just character you identify with plus character you think is hot? So it's like... <laughs> A big portion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's understandable. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Max and Ruby, a podcast with slides where people talk about Ruby with me, Max. Uh, I am your host, uh, the Red Mage Eldena Doublecast, a.k.a. a quarter cup of pasta water. Um, I'm <laughs> now using any pronouns, because if I'm going to go around looking like this, I might as well. Uh, you can find me on both Twitter and Tumblr at Doublecast, spelled D-O-U-B-L-E-C-A-5-T, because roll clip of Aaron Zek. The five is clearly an S. Gotta get my full $30 worth out of that one. Um, I'm joined today by a wonderful panel of guests. Uh, when I go to your slide, please let everyone know your name, your pronouns, if you make content, what kind of content do you make, and where people can find you on social media. Hi, I'm Erin, uh, she, her, my uh, Tumblr is 12Clara, and I am explosive underscore sky on Twitter, and on AO3, I'm explosive sky, and I'm a writer. Lovely. Maria. I'm Maria. <laughs> the second that I looked away from the screen. Typical. Um, I'm Maria. I don't really make content. I just shit post. But I'm on Twitter at the Queen of Memes and Tumblr at Shitty Winged Eyeliner. Oh, and I use she her pronouns. Not making content is really the most valid way to exist. Mm. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, I'm Rio. I use they them pronouns. Um, I'm lipstick giraffe on every social media out there. Uh, I recently did Babs Draws Yang, so that's good new content, and I'm a cosplayer and shit poster. I saw the Babs Draws Yang, that looked really good. Thank you. Oh, that's me. Um, hi, I'm <laughs> Wish. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm Pixel Wishes on pretty much everything except for Tumblr, where I'm Pixel Wishy, and I cosplay, shit post, and pretty much do a little of everything. And now make TikToks, apparently. Yes, and I make TikToks. <laughs> Found those. I, I've been very entertained with your TikToks. I don't even go on uh, that app ever, but just seeing like a couple filter through now and again has been pretty fun. Have fun. Oh, man. Okay, let's just get right into errors, no missions, because uh, there are a few people uh, leaving comments on the last video. Okay. First of all, uh, Crying Cat, because in the last episode we were debating whether or not Pyrrha would be able to sense that Mercury has robot legs, um, and Crying Cat pointed out that even if she could sense he had robot legs, it wouldn't matter because Pyrrha is definitely too polite to point it out to anyone. <laughs> Which, you know what, I will take that headcanon. That seems valid. Um, Kyle Edmund, uh, oh, because we were talking about, um... Uh, I was mistake. I think I said that um, Kara Eberly ships White Rose, and I think Wish said that she ships White Knight, and Wish was correct on that because uh, Kyle Edmund clarified uh, Kara does actually ship White Knight. Um, she has said she did make the joke about Weiss being a useless lesbian, but sadly, that was only joke. It's joke. You know, you can't win them all. What are you gonna do? Um, in the last episode, we were discussing, I made a whole thing about how, um, like, Weiss has a whole 
plotline about being really, really into Neptune, and then they spend, like, a lot of time on that, and then it's dropped, like, out of nowhere and just never mentioned again. Uh, Robert Watson did, uh, point it out that they actually do show her losing interest in Neptune on screen, because it's when she gets mad at him for flirting with Team Indigo during the Vital Festival, um, but considering that's just, like, a single throwaway joke, uh, I feel like my broader point still stands in the sense of, like, they used so much time on that, and then basically, like, threw it out very unceremoniously, um, feel feels like a lot of time spent on something that was very inconsequential. Um, Zonix, oh, right, because, uh, Mercedes mentioned how like, leading up to Volume 7, people were, like, really hype on Nora backstory or the potential for Nora backstory that never, uh, materialized. Um, Zonix pointed out that, um, like, no one actually said, like, on the crew that Nora would get backstory in Volume 7. It, that, like, all the people saying that, it were speculating off a quote from Sam Ireland, who's Nora's, uh, voice actor, who just said Nora would play, like, an important role in Volume 7, um, and so people took that to mean, like, oh, she's gonna be the Winter Maiden, or, uh, her, like, maybe her mom is the Winter Maiden, or we're gonna get all this Nora backstory. It turns out it was just that she's, like, the, the person on the team who was, like, the, the most vocal opponent of Ironwood, which is still good. We love Antifa Nora, but sadly, um, no, no backstory. We'll have to wait a little bit for that. Um... And then finally, uh, Merck and I got into a disagreement about whether the team consisting of Cinder, Mercury, Emerald, and Neo should be pronounced Team Seaman or Team Cinnamon. Um, the Greater Sea proposed a compromise, which is Team uh, Cumin. And you know what? <laughs> I can get behind that. I think that's fair. Uh, Merck, if you're watching this, DM me with your thoughts on Team Cumin. Okay, now on to the actual episode. Volume 3, this is the one where everything goes to shit. In the story, I think this is where everything gets really good. Um, okay, before we actually start talking about our thoughts and opinions on this, we have a new person today, so that means, Aaron, tell us, how did you get into Ruby? Okay, well, I actually got into Ruby this volume, Volume 3. Um, I came in at the very, very end because... I followed someone on Tumblr at the time and they reblogged like the famous, you know, Blake and Yang scene. And I was like, oh, this is actually gay. <laughs> so I have to watch it now. Of and um, I think the first episode I actually watched live might have been the finale. Oh, wow. So you came in yeah. like at the most intense possible moment. Yeah, I literally came right in here. Um, so my overall impression is probably pretty biased because it's like very sentimental. Um, it is definitely one of my favorite volumes. Um, I think this is like the shift into yeah more serious storytelling and content, like where it gets a little more mature, and you can kind of, I feel like rally behind the show as like an actual, um, like contesting the actual landscape of all of these this content basically. So, um, yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of it. <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah, let's just get right into overall impressions. Uh, Maria. So I'm not gonna lie, I really didn't want to have to rewatch this volume because the second half especially is just like pain and suffering and not <laughs> in the way that watching volume one is pain and suffering got him but i do mean that in a good way because it is like so compelling and memorable but it just it's like watching the maze hughes die in full metal Alchemist say it's I don't like have to watch this it's like the first mm. few episodes of brotherhood where they give you the two emotional gut punches back to back yes uh wish this is probably one of my favorite volumes um i do like how it shifts from being like sort of lighthearted into a lot more serious um topics and like honestly the finale and like the last two or three episodes had me like I was, like, shaking. I was anticipating something more, like, worse to happen the whole time. And then, you know, bad stuff did happen. Um, and then I couldn't, I didn't know what to expect for, like, the following season. So, like, it kept me on my toes. I like this volume. Rio? 
Uh, this is my most watched season of Ruby, like, ever. I have watched this so many times over and over again. Like, it's my comfort season of Ruby, <laughs> which is horrible considering how much bad stuff happens. But, like, that stuff is so good that, like, I honestly consider this volume, like, maybe my favorite, but a close second would be volume six. So good. <laughs> I'm I'm in a very similar boat where like this is like definitely up there in terms of like if not my favorite like definitely like second or well maybe third depending on how high I'm putting seven um but mm -hmm. like uh yeah this is the one where I was like oh shit is getting real now there's like an actual I have like an actual investment in this show and like this I don't know it just felt like everything really clicked this volume from like the storytelling to like the plot kicking into high gear to just the drama of it all and the intensity of it um yeah I probably watched this volume more than any other volume though I mm -hmm. think part of that is uh, having to watch uh, Pira and Penny's death like 80 shit zillion times to make stupid edits of them. <laughs> so, you know. It's kind of, kind of cheating. So, <laughs> um, okay, let's just get right into the good because that's most of this PowerPoint. Because you know what? This is, we've got, we've got good vibes today. We're feeling good about this volume. We've got yes, a lot really. of, got a lot of positive things to say. Um, first of all, the thing that everyone remembers about this volume is the, the trauma. I feel like <laughs> this is the point where, one thing I appreciate about volume three is that by, like, having these two huge, well, I guess they could be twists, the, the two huge, like, major character deaths at the end of the volume, like, it changes the way people watch the show, in the sense that, like, every volume going forward, you know that a major character death is now a possibility. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, if you had just seen volumes one and two up to this point, if this was just airing, like, the idea of someone actually really dying would be kind of unthinkable, I feel like. Like, it really came out of left field when this first aired. Agreed. Um, when Penny turned into quarters. <laughs> Stop this! Oh no! Pura, Pura is a great investor, Let's man. Change. Oh man, she, uh, you know what? I had this. I had something about this on a later slide, but because we've already mentioned Full Metal Alchemist, one thing I appreciate about the Ruby fandom compared to like, okay, FMA specifically, FMA has one joke. That whole th there's lots of funny stuff in the show, but the fandom has a joke that they tell over and over and over again, and you get kind of sick of it after a while. And so, like, I'm glad that, like, Ruby memes are more than just, like, you know, Penny getting turned into quarters or Pyrrha getting turned into dust. Like, we have, we have, we have a variety. Bit, we have a bit more to work with than that. Mm -hmm. We have the range. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. do. We have the range. Yes. You're so right. All right. So first things first. Uh, no, Penny. Um, what, let's get some like initial reactions. How was everyone uh, feeling when they first saw this scene? Mm. Uh, I did not get this one spoiled for me because I spoiled Pyrrha's death for myself, but not Penny's. And Penny was one of my favorite characters, so I was very upset. Oof. I don't remember. I don't even remember at the time, but I think it was a lot of like. Oh, they can just fix her. She's a robot. Like, <laughs> like this is this must be reversible. Of course, somehow. I spoiler like, really alert. liked Penny. Like, spoiler alert. No, I did really like Penny. I feel like she was kind of people went like either way on her at the time, but I was I was devastated. Uh, wish Rio. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Whoever. <laughs> I mean, I am on the opposite side of the spectrum here because I thought that this was like the coolest way that they could, they could have possibly killed this character <laughs> off. It's like I did not. I absolutely did not think that this show that had previously been like so lighthearted and just memes basically would literally slice her in, into pieces and then <laughs> you watch as her eyes like lose life. Like I was sitting there screaming at the top of my lungs like holy shit they did that they did that but i was happy about it yeah <laughs> and did they did they have like a bunch of like really fucked up takes am i allowed to say fuck on this show yeah you can say whatever <laughs> okay, you <great>. want <laughs> awesome okay so yeah did they have like a, they had like a bunch of uh like fucked up alternate cuts of like her death where she like 
says things or she like looks at Ruby and says something. I, there's some like really fucked up thing. I don't wish I could remember exactly what it was, but I like, I remember being extremely glad that they went with what they did because it is more heartbreaking. And also like, I don't think I could handle Penny being like, I'm combat ready as she's like fucking, you know, uh... doing the robot version of bleeding out on the, Holy shit! Some, yeah, it was like fucked up. Some poor animator. I don't see it though. Some poor animator had to do like twenty takes of Penny's death, <laughs> just oh, watching God. this poor girl get chopped Rip. up over and over again. Uh, oh, Penny. Uh, wish. I feel oh, she's um, gazing at me. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I had actually fallen off watching Ruby by this point, and I think this was around the point where Rio like messaged me and was like, "You have to watch this now." <laughs> so I started catching up, and when I got to this point, I was like, "Oh my god, they they really they really killed someone." I mean, they can probably rebuild her, but damn, they really killed someone, and like. I was not expecting anything that else felt. I thought that was going to be the only death. I was like, that's 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 the quota for this season. And then it just, you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there was another death of someone who can't be rebuilt. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how is, okay, how, how were, <laughs> what was everyone's reaction to that scene? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was very similar to my reaction to Penny's because I was like, holy shit, they're doing it again. This is so great. <laughs> he can't that keep getting away bad. with it. I miss Pira. I do. I still miss Pira. I miss Pira mm. every day. Let's be honest. Oh, don't oh. Know. Okay, at, at least you kill off the hottest character. Like, <laughs> right mm, that's a really good point. Apparently, speaking um, of fucked up alternatives, though, I think this is in the Shane letter, which we'll get to. Oh, but God. apparently, Monty originally wanted it to be John <laughs> who sees Pierre at the top of the tower and not Ruby, which is just, oh, Ooh. Oh, oh God, or, which would have been Ow. horrible. Yeah, would have been worse in many ways. Like, yeah, um, yeah, we'll we'll get into that. There's a lot of discourse around um that whole situation. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, like, Pyrrha's death, like, like you said, because Aaron, you know, since it's a robot, people kind of had the impression of like, oh, well, you know, they'll just rebuild her. And I think they waited, like, the appropriate amount of time for that to happen, because it was, mm -hmm. like, just long enough for people to be like, god damn, they're really never gonna fix Penny, are they? <laughs> <laughs> and for it to, like, yeah. drift into, like, wild, like, tinfoil hat territory, and then she comes back. Um, mm -hmm. Which was very smart. But Pira is like the real gut punch of like, no, this is over. She's actually gone for good now. But you know what? It's like the thing about Pira that in her death, which I do respect of the show, is that like, I think it makes sense. Like, and I, I talk about this people all the time, actually, because this is obviously one of the big discourse points is Pira dying. But like, I think there really is not another way that this scene could have gone. Like, of course, Pira is going to try and fight. Like, she could not do anything else. She wasn't going to, like, turn away and be like, no, I'm going to leave this to other people. Like, she was thinking this was her destiny and she needs to do everything she can to, you know, save everyone else and blah, blah, blah. Like, of course, she was going to go up there and ultimately die. Like, yeah, she's got the death flag. She's got the death flag. Of course, she's based on Achilles. So, like, obviously there. But, like, yeah, I, like, respect the storytelling of it because, like, I think sometimes in fandom you lose a lot of nuance between like um this character this character died to further you know the pain of somebody else or further the story or blah 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 and then just like this character died because there's no other way this literally could have gone because of what we know about this character and i feel like pira gets put into the the former category a lot where people are like she died to further ruby's pain or like died to further the story but it's like you know, she can do both of those things, basically. Like, she she died because there was no other way her character was going to go. And also, it ended up furthering the story. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so I actually really respect kind of how they how they ultimately did that. Yeah, I have, Same. I have issues with Pyrrha's death that we'll get into on another slide. However, <laughs> while I do have issues with, like, well, it's it, most of my problems are, like, how it was executed, like, logistically. Mm, and, like, the actual, okay. like, storytelling of it, or the, the, the more, like, narrative uh, aspects. But I think on an emotional and a thematic level, it works beautifully. Um, 
Because like you were saying, it's like, well, is there any other way this could have gone? And I like, I was really pissed when it first happened because I was like, of course that's an unwinnable fight, Pyrrha. Like, why would you take that? That's so stupid. Like, you're just holding the idiot ball today. But like, the more I thought about it, it's like, you look back on Pyrrha's character and like all her interactions with Jean especially, you do get the sense that she is the kind of person who like will put others above herself and like helping others above herself to the point where she's like, it's like actually a detriment to her. Yeah. Which is like a very good trait to have to a point. Mm -hmm. Because you will eventually just, even like in real life when you meet people like this who will just like, you know, spread themselves too thin and get burnt out or like, you know, they're just like very easily taken advantage of because they're always trying to help people and always trying to be there for someone, even if that person doesn't have them in their best interests. Mm. And I think you see a lot of that with Pyrrha in the sense that, like, when she first meets Jean, like, I mean, like, the, 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 you could make the argument of, like, oh, she's just going really far out of her way for Jean because she's thirsty for him. And, like, that's obviously the funnier explanation, so I like it. But <laughs> the, the other way to look at it is, like, you know, she arrives at Beacon and encounters the most, like, buffoonish oaf in the room who is clearly not cut out for this and is going to be struggling the whole time. And she's like, I need to get him back on track. Like, her first instinct is mm -hmm. always to, like, go way out of her way to help someone, even if she gets, like, really nothing from it. To the point yeah. where, like, I mean, there were teachers who literally said, like, oh, she's carrying her team. Like, so... <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, I think that's just sort of how she's wired. And so yeah, it makes yeah. sense that she would um, ultimately take a fight she couldn't win because she knew that there there was a chance that she could make a difference. She's well, and also a... I like... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, it's fine. I was just going to say she's named uh, after like a Pyrrhic victory, which basically means like a victory, but at a great cost. So mm. there was a lot of theories that something was going to happen to her, but like until Penny's death, nobody actually, like, believed it. And then after Penny's death, they started analyzing the opening where she's the first one to fall out of the circle. And they were like, oh, no, is Pyrrha next? But nobody <laughs> believed it. And then it happened. Oh, my God. So. The tinfoil I mean, hat people are right occasionally. They do. They do. Well, if you guess enough, like, you're going to get one thing right, you know? You throw <laughs> yeah. out enough theories. Broken clock. Yep. But, like, I also, you know, I don't think Pierre, like, went up there to die. Like, I think her intention was hopefully, like, you know, she told Jean to get Glinda or whatever she said. But, you know, like, I hope, I think she wanted to hold her off enough until other people could come back her up. And then, unfortunately, as we saw, Ruby did not get there quite in time to do that. And neither did anybody else. Right. Yeah. So nothing played out there the no. way I think she would have wanted. It makes sense. Um, Maria, do you have any thoughts on this? Not that really, nothing that hasn't already been said. Lovely. Um, okay. I think another thing that, like, really hurts the end of this is just, like, the status quo in general has just been completely thrown out in that, like, by the end of this volume now, the whole team is split up, um, and everyone, the objectives are a lot less clear, because, you know, Ruby says she's going to Mistral, but, like, what is she even going to find there? What are they really looking for other than just, you know, vague answers, quote-unquote, and you have no idea what everyone else is up to. Um, well, you know what Yang's up to, but it's not good. Um, Badly. <laughs> um, so it's sort of like, uh, I feel like this is the, the, like, the crazy thing about Volume 3 is that it leaves you really having no idea what's next, and there's something really commendable about that, that they just throw out, like, everything you know about the show, and they're, you're mm -hmm. basically starting over at this point. Cool. All right. Let's <laughs> just move on. Uh, all right. Other good stuff about um, Volume 3. Uh, the fights, they're still good, um, as always. Um, first of all, the Vital Festival in general, I feel like it kind of gets overshadowed by, like, all of the trauma, but, like... Those are some really fun fights. Um, they are. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some of my favorites, I really, okay, like, there's a couple that are just very good for um, comedic purposes, like um, uh, uh, Juniper versus Bronze and mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Sun versus Indigo. Um, I think, uh, Rio, you were the one who put uh, Yang and Weiss versus Neon and Flint on here. 
Yeah. I mean, I personally found that hilarious, but mostly just because Weiss is, like, not good at the fight, which is just something that she's just... That's part of her character up until this point, is just she can never win a fight, and she literally just, like, jumps into lava and is like, Oh! Go Yang! And then Yang has to deal with this manic cat girl who is just throwing out insults left and right and it's just for me it was hilarious but all the other fights were pretty funny too (laughs) i don't even know why they picked weiss for the doubles tournament i'm like she's the one that loses all the time i know she She does eventually get better but yeah like up until this point it's just like she has lost every single fight oh (laughs) As soon as she, as, like, Flint came up from the, like, um, the geyser, I was just like, oh, come on. They couldn't even, she literally kamikaze him and he survived. Like, that, at that <laughs> point, it's just a yeah, meme. Yeah, like, what? <laughs> oh, Christ. Yeah, yeah, Weiss, she, she gets it together eventually, but that really is one of the saddest running themes in the show, is just Weiss <laughs> can't win 1v1s. Oh, Weiss. Poor Weiss. Poor Weiss. I have to say, this is a hard time. Um, Maria, you have some you 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 take some issue with Team Funky. You are not a fan, if I recall correctly. I just kind of annoying. Um, I mean, they get once they come back in season seven, I don't really care. But like the meme characters, I'm like, eh. Y- y'all really named the black guy Flint Cole. Um, <laughs> I think the horn is kind of annoying. Although I did notice that the music that's playing during that fight is like horn versions of the other songs from the soundtrack which oh is yeah amazing. i love those i also yeah, actually I didn't, think... I didn't pick up on that first time around i think actually flint cole is also a running inside joke with achievement hunter that he is like the concept existed like a really really long time before they yeah put he's the some movie, kind yeah. of like rt in joke yeah yeah doesn't make it better, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's yeah. really, I feel like that's the kind of thing where, like, you're only, the only thing you can really do is just, like, stare deadpan into the camera like you're on The Office. Like, there's just, it's like, come on, man. Um, I will say, I appreciate the existence of Neon Cat, even though I do find her kind of irritating in the show, uh, for the, just the funniest headcanons I have ever ever seen of people coming up with just wild shit for her on Twitter. Um, <laughs> the amount of, pe- the amount of uh, like, cokehead neon cat tweets I have seen is truly yeah. astounding. And the-, the- Clear is like a raver who's like constantly on Molly. Why would you do cokehead? That doesn't make any sense. That's actually a good point. <laughs> MDMA True. would make way more sense for her. I have to start tweeting at like um, the that that whole um, there's there, it's like one group chat that's like keeping it going. I have to tweet at them to let them know they need to change. Yeah, make her. it. This will be the new discourse. You're gonna get called out on Twitter now for <laughs> erasing uh, cokeheads. Yes. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Christ. Oh no. <laughs> I mean, considering how this fandom operates, not outside the realm of possibility. Mm-hmm. Every week. <laughs> You're gonna get canceled over this. You are. We need I mean we need something new, you know, we need a new drama every week. I think it should be Cokeheads versus people on Molly at Raves. Like this is it. <laughs> Obviously. God What is Neon Cat? It's like uh it's it's like back when uh do you guys remember Tweaker Tumblr? God. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that was oh, unfortunately. <laughs> That was amazing. It was such like a damn. People really just will post literally anything on this site. There's just no sure rules. Do. Oh my god. Um. Yeah. Fight's very cool. Also, the arena is just a great concept. Mm, yes. Oh yeah, I love For it. Sure. I mean, yeah, and Ruby's like always been like that's a strong a strong aspect of the show. It's just their fights and their fight scenes and the creativity of them so i mean that whole the arena and it changing like that like that's it's just so cool they just did a good job with that yeah super versatile and like also they brought it back well a little bit in uh volume seven for the um uh ironwood uh watts fight which i thought was really cool Mm -hmm. like a neat callback um but yeah, it reminds me a bit of how um i wonder if this is where they got the idea from because if you watch like um the the first season of Pokemon when they're oh my in the- god yes yeah I also okay that. 
Yeah, because they have the 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 battlefield in the Indigo League is like I forget if it's randomized or if it's like a coin flip or something, but like they oh, have like a bunch of different terrains that people fight on. Um, yes, I also oh. remember thinking I was like, oh, Pokemon respect. Yeah, now I remember. Oh shit. <laughs> This uh, show very much wears its influences on its sleeve for better or mm-hmm. for worse. And, uh, you know, that's, I'd, I'd say that one's for better. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, some other good fights that I want to highlight. I have a, sp- a, a special place in my heart for Ruby versus Roman and Neo on oh, completely the agree. ship. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. I have, I have a whole rant about this, but if other people want to, like, go off on this first, please do. Uh, I mean, that shit was so fucking good because Neo just, like, disappears, just, like, flies away like Mary Poppins, and then the whole (laughs) being eaten thing in his, like, villain monologue is high comedy. It's so good. It's just, like, I think that was, like, the one thing, like, I genuinely did not see that coming at that moment. (laughs) Because it's, like, you think a villain, there's gonna be some kind of, like, an actual fight and, you know, whatever. And instead, he just is, like literally like bored to death immediately right there <laughs> why would you <laughs> say that the eight roman torchwick is the mvp of the season that's so true you're so correct your brain is huge <laughs> god yeah it's it's very true i my my the thing i love about this fight aside from you know watching ruby get creative and again like rio said mary poppins neo out into the ether is the um, fact that it's just like opening the umbrella is enough to do yeah. it <laughs> Because we yeah. all know that umbrella is OP as shit. It's like the oh, strongest yeah. material on Earth. And she just presses <laughs> the button and it's like, whoosh. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Yeah, that's super clever because, like, again, Neo's whole thing is just, like, you cannot hit her. So the fact that she finds some, like, quirky workaround to get her off the battlefield is super fun. Um, But the thing I love about this fight is, like, Roman's whole speech in the end, I think, is sort of, like, the first glimpse we get at, like, the real themes of this show in the sense that what he's trying to tell Ruby is like, you know, the world is cold and cruel and it doesn't care about your feelings and you just have to do whatever you can to survive. Like, you can't be the hero, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in the midst of going on about how he's going to live because, like, he's willing to, like, be an asshole and just, you know, um, like, go along with whoever is winning, basically, or just, or basically just fall in line with Salem because he knows her victim, victory is inevitable, excuse me. Um, he just gets immediately eaten by the same cruel, (laughs) uncaring world he was just bragging about being better equipped to handle than her. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that has a lot of, like, thematic relevance in the sense that like going forward a big theme in the show is like having hope in the face of impossible odds and like staying true to like your values and like wanting to help people and save people even if it seems hopeless and like that's just like a really good like microcosm of that yeah i never thought about that but you're right now that scene has some depth to it that i never put there (laughs) Oh, yeah, we're getting deep today. Also, just, again, seeing Roman get bored by a bird is just super funny. It will never... Absolutely. Oh, it's so good. It's it will... just a great death. It, it will like, never get old. Um, top character death in Ruby, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pug, who's not on, who was on the last episode, hated Roman so much, and so she was, like, elated when we got to this episode. Oh, that's so funny. I actually <laughs> love Roman as a villain. I thought he was so great. But his death was just... Even better. Yeah. God, I, I appreciate the camp uh, that Roman brings to the table. Oh, time exactly. To time, the drama, same. the pizzazz. Like, love it. I definitely think that he sort of, he did wear out his welcome by the end where I was like, okay, like, mm-hmm. they can't they can't keep him around forever. Yeah. It was time. Exactly. That's how I feel about Cinder now. Ooh, yeah. that's a discourse. <laughs> yeah. Don't put that in. I'm going to get canceled on Twitter. It's okay. <laughs> no one gets canceled over this podcast. It's all in good time. <laughs> Everyone's opinion is valid. Um, mm. Other good things. Uh, okay, so this is like a small detail that I thought was just ridiculously cool. Uh, weaponizing the rocket lockers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's so great. Having the... Because, um, like, in Volume 1, they just sort of casually mentioned, like, oh, yeah, you can send it to... You can send your locker to wherever you want. 
and you don't even think about it except for that joke where Jean literally gets shoved into a locker <laughs> and then yeah. launched to some unknown location. But then they bring it back, like, not even once, they bring it back, like, three times, because Pira shoves Jean into a locker at the end to send him away. Um, and Ruby uses it to, like, launch herself up to the ship, and just, just like, taking... That's so smart. Just mm -hmm. taking advantage of that, like, very minor lore detail they threw in early on that everyone completely forgot about is just so clever. Yeah, I really, I think, again, it's, like, similar to the umbrella, right? Like, Ruby just opening her umbrella. Like, they just kind of take all these details and then use them in ways that you really don't expect. Yeah. But are very clever. Also, just the lockers impaling the Nevermore on the arena floor was really cool. Oh, anyway, my God, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, my God. It was so good. Um, that whole scene, actually, it, like... I think Rio, you were saying it's 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 like one of those shots in like the Avengers where they zoom out and you see all the heroes at once. Yes, <laughs> this is the hero scene that we were supposed to get in Volume Five. Okay, <laughs> they did it once. Why couldn't it happen again? This was so good. They lined up. Everyone had a purpose. Everyone fought. Everyone was badass. And just like the cinematography of it all, just wow, the drama. <laughs> we're fans of the drama here that. oh absolutely <laughs> yeah i think um uh the the like well we'll get to volume five when we get to volume five <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah having everyone come together at the end even though like all of these characters were just like you know one-offs with no lines who are basically just there to lose fights to the main characters it's still fun to like bring them all back and have them contribute in some way it's just like uh, mm -hmm. like you know what like you didn't have time to do like the full shonen tournament arc where you give everyone a tragic backstory so that you have like a reason to like you know feel conflicted about beating them but um you know you made the best with what you had um and i appreciate that some real effort was yeah. put in um rio you wanted a whole point for velvet oh yes. my god yeah oh, yeah velvet, <laughs> velvet. Oh my god. Okay, so last episode I talked about how much I cried about volume two, but don't even get me started on this scene. Velvet god. with her weapon. Oh my god, I've sobbed oh so many we times. Waited. We waited Holy so shit. to know what was in that box. And then they oh my all god. the clips from the trailers. And the like, song! It was, it was like a tribute <laughs> oh my to god. Monty, and I was like crying because it was all his old animation clips and like uh, it was good. I'm gonna cry right now. Oh no! I'm gonna oh cry. god! I didn't even realize that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, it's all the it's all the clips that he animated for the trailer redone in Velvet with the tribute song playing. Oh so. god! <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. That's like my favorite scene actually in almost the entire show. I just wish he would have won the fight. I just want that she on gets, repeat. Like, punched by the robot, and I'm like, that's really anticlimactic. Like, <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah, she, she should have won. The robot out. Yeah. But then why summoning after that is like so powerful. I'm getting emotional. Oh my oh, god. god. Yeah. <laughs> no, god, it like I'm makes me up. I know, it like literally gives me the chills like every time I watch it. It's just such an excellent, incredible scene. Oh my god. And then Velvet, like, okay, Vel I think we have a point for this, but Velvet using Penny Swords. Oh, oh, mm. a Ruby oh picking god. up one of Penny's swords. Yeah, I forgot to do that in the last <laughs> oh slide. Yeah. But yeah, that got that got me emotional. It's so good. It's oh my so god. Good. And especially because it's fucking, like oh. Oh, so I don't, I actually don't, I don't know if this is true or not because I actually haven't looked into it. Is Velvet, like, basically, what is, what is her influence? It's supposed to be the Velveteen Rabbit? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's what I always got because I was just like, oh my god, like, obviously, to be, you know, in order to be real, you have to be loved enough, this whole point of that story. And so the fact then that she just uses Penny's sword, it's like, always just takes me the fuck out. Like, oh my god, like, she makes Penny real, like, right there. Like, that's what she does in that moment, and I'm, like, going to cry. I have chills. I have I chills. It's just, it's just like, it's so fucked up. The symbolism. Even... The like, symbolism. They have oh. a thing about how, like, weapons are an extension of yourself, and she's yes. able to catalog everybody's weapon. So, oh. it's so good. Velvet okay. deserved more screen time. Yeah. And the build up is going to be coming oh. back. It's going to happen. Please. She better. The, She's gonna come back and go away. Whenever they go to Vacuo, there better be yep. more Team Coffee content. I know they're getting again. They really they got all their development um, shunted mm -hmm. into the uh, YA novels, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I've heard those are pretty good. 
but yeah, we, we need we need Team Coffee back. There was a lot that could have been done with them, and I need to see more people thirst for Coco Adele, because it's going to be fun. Oh, Vacuo is going to be a hell of a hell of an arc. Oh my god. I'm so excited. I'm ready. <laughs> the hype. Oh man. Um, all right, we've also got some new characters to talk about. Crow and Winter. Mm. Um, I really didn't like winter at first i'm gonna be completely honest it took me a while to like she took me a while to grow on her mm. um same like I'm just with you yeah like just at first she comes out so like aggressive and just like um like honestly a little cruel um yeah to weiss at first but then like as you go on you learn that that's like mostly a front i feel like yeah like, she feels the need to be, like, really, really, like, cold and uncaring just to keep up her appearances as this, like, tough general person. But, like, she really does yeah. care for Weiss. She just also wants her to get better. Yeah. Um, she, so, <laughs> I I was much under the um, impression of, haha, rude lady hot. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> you and many others. Step on me. <laughs> there it is, yeah. Um, like, also, like, um... There was a couple scenes that caused some controversy with her, but, like, you can tell that she actually really cares about her sister in some of the later scenes, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, she does, and obviously, like, we know kind of what Weiss has come from. Yeah. And I think it's just, like, the way Winter escaped that was just being this strong, like, unflinching person. And so she knows Weiss wants to escape the same situation, and so I think she's just projecting, like, you know, this is how I have done it, this is what you need to do. Yeah, I think that part yeah, of her I character. Yeah, it's pretty coherent when you have like the whole story. Yeah, um, definitely comes together. Maria, do you have any first impressions here? Um, I have complicated feelings about Crow, but like <laughs> his introduction is super fun. Um, like also the comedy, also just like that <laughs> he's kind of the when the like the plot finally gets introduced, he's like the <laughs> this is ridiculous kind of commentary guy um their fight is really good um i do think i'm not a fan of some of like the characters that were introduced just for the tournament because i think it is an ongoing problem that ruby just like introduces a bunch of side characters and doesn't really do anything with them yeah but then again it is like a tournament arc and like especially if, it, if we're doing four on four battles you kind of have to introduce some characters mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's again sort of the limitations of the format where it's like you want you want to be anime so bad and you want this tournament arc to happen, but like you don't have enough time to really do the whole 9 yards, but I don't know. I think for what it is, it's fine. It's like sometimes a character just exists to look cool for a little bit and then go away. Um yeah. don't we even get well me establish the rule of cool with her. Don't even get me yeah. started on talk. Uh, when she shows up in yeah. volume six. Oh my god. Yep. Um, and I also think like they don't do they don't always like use them obviously to the best of their ability, but I do think they do flesh out the world a little bit. Like just knowing all of these characters do exist, even if they're not utilized right now. It's like how we're talking about vacuum. Like we know all the potential vacuum because we know all of these characters and all things they can do, and like that's exciting. Yeah, so, they like, brought funky back for seven. Um, yeah, I'll be exactly. briefly. So it's like they don't completely disappear. Yeah. Unless you're cardinal. <laughs> Lol. Yeah, but thank God. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, Keep them away. Yeah, good good <laughs> thing. I I I <laughs> I am getting behind the theory that they died in the fall of Beacon, because yeah. oh, man. Same. What else? They were they didn't even they were like the the most boring character designs too. Like they had they nothing were. going for them. They had the John thing going for them. Oh god. Well, we saw Cardin, right? So Yeah. He's out True. there somewhere. <laughs> we have another slide with Jean on it, but fortunately it's not uh it's not another one of my Jean slides where I just bitch about him for like twenty minutes. <laughs> this is cause this is the volume where he starts to get a little bit better. <laughs> He's like bearable. He starts getting bearable now. Yeah. Yeah. Um the the Crow and Winter fight, I think, is a lot of fun both for like the choreography and the action of it, but also just seeing Weiss and Ruby on the sidelines cheering yeah. them on. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that line where yeah. she's like, Who what kind of crazy person that's my uncle, go get her, Crow. Yeah. 
I think that Crow was kind of interesting because, like, the first time you really see him is, like, he's completely, like, smashed. And, like, you're like, why is this man drinking so much? And, I mean, we he's kind drunk. of learned. He's always drunk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. God, yeah, he's fun. See, I feel like this is also the beginning of uh, one of a lot of people's least favorite discourses, which is Crow is secretly Ruby's dad. Oh my yeah. God, yes, that is absolutely oh, my that. Favorite <laughs> I don't care what Miles and Carrie say, it's true. God. <laughs> Maria. The creators are obviously wrong. They, yes. were, they were like... Death of the author, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it would be a cool concept, but, like, the way that people were trying to, like, justify it was kind of, like, a roundabout way. And I was just like, guys, can we just wait for more plot before we try and figure out what's going on here? (laughs) Just like, well, they have the same aesthetics, so they have to be related by blood, obviously. Right. Aesthetics are, um... is genetic. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Um, okay... What else have we got here? Um, the villains have so much more to work with this volume. Thank God. I think in volumes one and two, they sort of like go back and forth between being sort of like, what, how do I want to describe this? Like they're not, they, they don't feel like a significant threat really in the first mm-hmm. two volumes. Um, mm-hmm. And like you can like send Rocket. Yes. <laughs> yeah, literally. Blasting off but, again. But like less interesting. <laughs> less less camp is why is yeah. the problem there um but you you kind of get the sense that like with emerald and mercury that there's a little more going on there but you don't really know what it is and then this volume gives you like save them a whole look into what's going like we still don't have cinder backstory i love the cinder flashback so much oh yeah me too just seeing, like, how she put the team together so you can see what they're all coming from um, just gives, like, each of their characterizations so much more where you can see what sort of motivates them and why they were set down this path. Um, and, I don't know, it just it, it gives you a lot to work with and a lot to speculate on going forward. It's like, the, it, I feel really bad for Emerald and Mercury because it's like she found them in like really bad circumstances and then they just latched on to her because she was like the only person around. And I'm like, I save them. Please save them. <laughs> like, I'm like half yeah. and half. I feel like that about Emerald, but I do hate Mercury. Like, I just hate, <laughs> like he's so, he, he's like so irredeemable to me. I just like can't. Even if they literally gave him an arc that was like redeeming Mercury, I'd be like, go away. Yeah, I think we're yeah. we're pretty clearly gonna get Emerald Redemption. At oh, point, for sure. I think at some point she says that like Dinder was like a mother to her or something, or like the closest thing to a mother she ever had. And like, yeah. ooh, that's that's actually yeah, pretty sad. Some, uh, she's got some stuff going on there, definitely. Mm. I think like I think it's really interesting for context on you know those two characters. I think Cinder's backstory is obviously probably gonna come this volume, but. Um, I actually, the first time I watched this volume, I somehow skipped this episode, and I had no idea, because <laughs> oh you actually God. can't tell um, the oh, way yeah. that it was set up. So I went from, the, like, the Yang, you know, Yang and Mercury, just straight into right after this, where it picks up with Yang, and I had no idea that this episode existed. So I finally watched it one day, and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I was so confused. That is wild, man. I just think the metal, like, the, um, Mercury just, like, straight up murdered his dad, which he I did. thought was pretty, like... <laughs> metal wow i think that's very relatable for a lot of people oh yeah, yes no, it is <laughs> <laughs> that sweet that's... trauma bonding and codependency <laughs> this week on max and ruby kill your dad <laughs> that's nice. it's just greek mythology that's man that's what i can get behind <laughs> There's precedent. All right, that's a lot to unpack. Let's continue. <laughs> we don't have time to unpack all this. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay. Um. Yikes. Anyway. Um. Okay. Right. Um. What the hell was I even talking about? Yeah, we'll get Cinder backstory eventually, but I think having her like the all we know about her at this point is that she just craves power, and mm-hmm. like I think for the moment anyway. I don't mind her backstory being kind of vague 
uh, mm -hmm. to an extent. Like, I think it's okay to have, like, I mean, I'm sure we will get more insight into her, but I think it's fine to have, like, a villain whose, like, motivations aren't, like, super well-defined. They don't have any kind of, like, like, you know, tragic past they're trying to escape from. Um, but they just have, like, a very, one very clear thing driving her, them, and for her, it's mm -hmm. power. Um... I think it also, another thing I love about those flashbacks is that it illustrates another running theme in this show, which is that so many of the antagonists are driven into the position they're in, essentially, uh, essentially out of fear, um, more so than anything else. Because if you think about, like, like, okay, Roman joined up with Cinder because he thinks Salem's victory is inevitable, um... Leo, the headmaster in volume five, joined up with uh, Salem because he thinks her victory is inevitable. Um, Ironwood goes off the deep end because he thinks that the odds of beating Salem's like giant grim army are so low that he the only way he can get away from her is by, you know, sacrificing millions of people. Like all like such a running theme in the show is just like fear is what drives everyone to turn to the dark side, basically. Um and I think with, like, you see a little bit of that with Emerald and Mercury, where they're basically, like, brought in just out of necessity. Like, they have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, like, like, Cinder is one of the only people who seems, like, actively malevolent. Yeah, I, I really like how in later seasons you kind of see their reactions to things that are happening, and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even a little bit this season, like, Emerald is, like, kind of horrified by the fall of Beacon. Yeah, she mm -hmm. is. Mercury's into it, but Emerald's like, mm. <laughs> yeah. Mercury's like, this is dope. Mercury's just having a fun time. He he's just uh enjoying watching the world burn. Exactly. Full full uh Joker mode. All right. Um, speaking of the Grim, uh, one nice thing, and Rio, you pointed this out in the doc, and this was very smart, is that like the Grim feel like an actual threat this volume, and we did not have that up to this point. Yeah. And we don't really have it in later seasons very much. I mean, it looks like it's coming to get back to that after Volume 7, but, like, for a really long time, Grimm just seemed like kind of just like an insert that they could put into the show to have, like, a cool fight, but there's, like, nothing really scary about them, I, no okay. matter how much they say oh, that they're well, we dangerous. had the Godzilla, bitch. I, yeah, I disagree with you, <laughs> just specifically because of the Apathy episode. And oh, like... yeah. Oh, wait, I also disagree with you because of the Apathy episode. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, oh, but, like, one Grim being actually scary amongst, like, a ton of other ones isn't exactly to the extent that this volume did with the Grim. Yeah, well, like... Like, you see them trying to get back to it, but it's not to the extent that it could be. Like, it could be terrifying. They were but all I, the time. I don't know if they, like, need to be terrified. Because I think one of the things that I find interesting about is, like, the Grimm in Volume 3 are obviously such a big threat because there's so many of them. Yeah. Like, it's not even necessarily, like, the types. It's just that they are, like, overrunning. The look like, there's no way. There's, not, there's more of them than there are of the people, and there's, like, no way they can really even counter that. Um, I mean, you're right. I just feel like because Salem creates the Grim and that they're scared of Salem, that the Grim should be more scary to them than they are. But like, you're right about like the amount. And also, I think it's just like a like a kind of like a way to measure their power, right? Like we kind of in Volume Two when they go off to Mount Glen or whatever, like we see them getting tired, basically. Like they they're like exhausted after their fight. And I think, like, the more we go on, you see them, like, being able to handle these fights better with more ease and, like, more teamwork and taking on bigger threats. And I think it's, like, for me, it's, like, almost like a way that I can measure their the power, like, their strength, like, how they are growing yeah. um, throughout the volumes. Because they, like, seem to be able to handle things so much better. Because in later seasons, it's not really the Grim that are, like, the biggest problem. It's, like, the people in the world that are, like, the biggest mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, we have, like, yeah. a transition. Well, I mean, coming up, it should be a problem again. <laughs> So I'd like to see it really? actually be a struggle. <laughs> One thing that kind of this discussion kind of makes me wonder is like, I wonder if there was a way when they were doing Mountain Glen, because they they mention that Mountain Glen failed because it was overrun by Grimm. But I think that's another example of like, uh, telling not showing. And so I, they... wo I wonder if there was a way to like, have it more like visually communicated that like, you know, 
like there was no way this settlement could have survived because there were just too many grim there or maybe i'm just overthinking I, it i haven't played grim eclipse but i feel like they do talk about like more mountain glen lore in that game i think oh i have played that game a lot i think they do but it's not super you know story based so mm -hmm. it's um it's isn't grim eclipse I think they have like a map a... though that you fight on the on the mountain glen map uh -huh. I was gonna say, isn't um, uh, Grim Eclipse like a like a Muso game, like a Dynasty Warriors type thing? Yeah, but they have like uh, dialogue and stuff in there, and a little bit of a story. So I thought maybe they, it might. They have a story mode, but it's like not related to actual any of the real like actual canon events. Okay. Totally, it's kind of like, like it's like a bunch of separate characters and stuff. But they do have that map, and I think they have dialogue on that map about Mountain. I don't remember. Interesting. But I'm sure someone in the comments who has played a lot of Grim Eclipse will have uh will enlighten us as to what this is. So I'll put that in the next errors, no missions. Um, be like expose this guy's a fake gamer. <laughs> he doesn't remember every line from Grim Eclipse. God. <laughs> She's canceled. She's canceled. Let's count how many times I'm gonna get canceled during this podcast. Let's all keep track. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Drinking game. Keep it, right. keep it Max yeah. is at one. I think I'm at two. That's like half the fun of this podcast is just it throwing is. out blast. It's just throwing out hot takes and uh, hoping no one gets mad at you for them. Um, but it's okay. The I I always say that the pronoun check weeds out all the annoying people, so I don't think anyone will actually get mad. Oh, that's a good point. It's uh, it's strategic, man. All hmm. right. Um, other stuff. Other good stuff from the villains. Cinder's whole speech at the Vital Festival. Um, I think when this first happened. I was kind of neutral on it. I was just like, okay, she just needs to have her big villain moment where she was just like, look, look what the, the headmasters have wrought for you. But like the <laughs> more time goes on and the more we see the way the story has unfolded, God, so much of Ruby just gets infinitely better once you've seen the whole thing and are rewatching yeah. it. And I don't know like how much of that we can say like is to the credit of the writers for like setting all this stuff up away in advance and how much of it is like, it feels like they almost know too much of their own lore, but don't know how to dole it out in like a way that feels super satisfying. So it's like once you have the big picture, everything is like su crystal clear and works super well. But like watching it the first time through, there's so much stuff where you're just like, huh, what? <laughs> and like, it doesn't even register as important. Yeah, and I think, like, obviously, I'm not sure this has been talked about, but um, a big, I'm, I'm not even going to call it an issue, I'm more than I'm going to call it kind of like what I think we as viewers are really accustomed to, which is that this just really is like a very specific type of type of show with a very specific structure. Like, really is a short show, and they are so limited in what they can do and spend time on, and I think it's one of those things that no matter what, like, as viewers, we're always going to be like, this isn't quite right. Because we're used to getting like more exposition, we're used to seeing more, we're used to getting more backstory, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is just like what literally all other TV or movies are except this is what content is. And so I think like in that way, Ruby is really like fighting against sort of like what we are ingrained to expect from TV. And in a way, I think they are actually extremely successful at like countering that because if they weren't doing a good job, like we would have far more complaints and probably not still be here. So it's like one of those really interesting, I think, just like structure, structure discussions that you like compare them to everything else. And you're like, well, what is really working and what actually isn't? Yeah, it's an interesting point. I never really, I mean, like I've thought about that a little bit where there are definitely some things where I feel like I kind of give them a pass because I'm like, eh, it's a 15 minute show. Like you can't, you, you can't win them all. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I mean, that is, it's very true in the sense that they were like, limited but at the end of the day like we're all still here uh mm -hmm. like they got our attention and they've been keeping it ever since um i know there are plenty of people who would disagree on that point but you know we'll we'll get to them on the discourse slide um maria do you have any thoughts on this stuff yeah no, nothing it's already been said um i'm glad the plot has finally started we finally have the big bad excellent oh yes speaking of salem the reveal at the end gives me chills Mm, yes. That's a very good reveal. Especially when you really, like you hear the voice and then you finally put a face to it. Like that was just an excellent, excellent reveal. Mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah. Realizing like book ends. Yeah, realizing she was the narrator from the beginning is just yeah. like Oh yeah. It was just so good. It was such a good way to show that. Lovely. Um 
One final note on the villains, uh, the villains in this volume. Neo sadly go uh, gets put on a bus for a while after volume three. <laughs> But Neo goes to live on a farm. Yeah, exactly. A farm upstate. Um, yeah. But uh, you know what? She's still hot and a fashion icon. So, and we love her for it. Yes. Couture. Queen. The, uh, I think you mentioned like Neo uh, gets a lot of disguises. This is the beginning of her having a bunch of disguises, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. I love that so much. I wasn't expecting that because I thought that her, like her magic or semblance, whatever, it was just like doing those mirror type things, but then when you see her like actually take a different form, I that was so good. I like that. I want more of that. Oh yeah, in the fight at the beginning, where or the when I think it's when they're when Team Ruby is talking to Emerald and Mercury, and they ask them about their fight, and they have like a little flashback, and you see uh, Neo dressed up as someone, and then like right before she takes a guy out, her eyes change to the Neapolitan colors, and it's like mm. mm-hmm. yep. so good, mm-hmm. beautiful. Um, I also love that you it's... literally get stepped on by Neo. It's so mm-hmm. good. <laughs> I think the real Max and Ruby drinking game is every time someone wants to get stepped on. <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> Don't get too smashed. <laughs> that's a re- yeah. That's the real running theme. Um. Yeah, I think it also introduced... Neo's Disguise has introduced this fun element where uh, every time the camera, like, lingers on an extra for just a little too long, you're like, that's fucking Neo, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh my god, the the random discourse every season where somebody's like, that's Neo. It's like some random background person. That was always so funny. Listen, one time it's going to be Neo and we're all just gonna lose it. That's the thing, you never know. She could be anyone. Yeah, she's a good villain. I like her. Mm. We all love Neo. We all love her so much. Yeah, there's a reason why she's like everybody's best girl. Yeah, exactly. I know the joke is like she's the only, because she's mute, she's the only character who can't be dragged down by the writing. But like, she has so much going for her. She's just fun. Um, all right. We got jokes this volume, and, like, I have been pretty vocal about not being a fan of the comedy in Ruby, particularly in the first two volumes. Um, it always felt very cringy to me. But this volume, it it clicks. It works for me. Um, it There were so many lines that I, like, actually laughed at, out loud at, and I forgot, like, how many, like, gems there are in this volume. Um... Uh, you know what I'd call that victory? Shocking? No. Well earned. What you said is stupid. Um, like, uh, oh, uh, uh, if you were one of my men, I'd have you shot. If I were one of your men, I'd shoot myself. I feel like that one gets quoted a lot. Um, the Blake one. The next one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is the funniest. <laughs> she, Love it. She's like, Blake, but if Blake was ordered to spend time with you. Oh, so Weiss? Precisely. That's just such a great... <laughs> Anything that's like a joke at Weiss's expense, like a volume to the sister's friend's Weiss, all that is just excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, they're just so good. <laughs> love love dunking on Weiss. I know. Dunking on Weiss would be like a fun run. It it reminds me a bit, Maria, of like how all of the best jokes in Love Live are just dunking on uh, Nico. <laughs> yes. It's so like, sometimes you just need a character like that. Um. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, okay... <sighs> Wish, I forget, were you, like, more of a fan of the comedy in the early volumes? Um, I mean, I, not really. I, I, like, I thought that some of it was funny, but, like, a lot of it was kind of cliche. So I wasn't one of the people who was super into it. Okay. But, like, you would agree that, like, this is where, like, the comedy really picks up, or? I do think that, like, the comedy does get better in this volume. Um, and then you don't see nearly as many jokes going forward. Um, but they're always pretty funny, in my opinion, so. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, oh. personally, I th- I just think that the comedy in this volume is just, like, the calm before the storm. Like, there's so <laughs> much oh, yeah. jokes in the first half where they give you the illusion that everything is, like, fun and great and, like, actually funny, and then everything goes to shit, and then after that you, like, don't see very many jokes, if any at all, in the next volumes. So it kind of hits really hard. I think it's a really good way to set up the emotional trauma. Mm-hmm. False sense of security. 
it's like the first yeah. like half hour of a horror movie where like everyone's just having like a fun time on their vacation or yes. whatever. Oh yes. But without the knowledge that you're watching a horror movie. Exactly. Oh my god. Yeah, I think it's kind of unfortunate that like the show has to get like a lot more serious after this volume because I forgot how like comfortable they got writing all the banter at this point. And it is kind of a shame that like they can't there isn't more time for that. I mean, I do, I really do like the direction the show has gone since, but that is one thing where I'm like, you know, I kind of wish there was like a little more like fun banter and stuff. Um, so that was a highlight. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like if they had time, like where's the Ruby Beach episode? You know what I mean? Like the Ruby <laughs> Beach episode. I have a whole thing about this. Um, yeah, like where is it? Right? Come on, man. The, what, vacuo. It has to be in vacuo. It has to be like Salem. Let's just chill for a minute. Let's go hit the hit the hit the waves. Let's go to the beach each. Let's go get away. <laughs> like you're telling me, like Salem wouldn't be like, let me put on my sick ass swimsuit with like the best titty window. Like that's like her thing. Like she's all about like the fashion. <laughs> Nora's got a hammer. She can break open a watermelon. Yuck! Okay. Go! Oh my god, it's that- coming together. This is the sad part about them being on such a tight timeline is that you can't, you you don't have time for the filler episodes in the early volumes. Yes, it's true. Ah, oh, yeah, God. Yeah, this could re- actually really benefit from filler, weirdly enough. Because we would just yeah. like love to see them all just like fuck around. Yeah, so, I want them to have fun. Yeah, so it's like there's again the structure thing, but you know, can't have it all. I understand. They'll find some time for for some fun eventually, I'm sure. Yeah, one day they're going to be like the beach episode and we're all going to like go fucking crazy. It won't last very long, but they'll try. I think that's what people like, (laughs) I've noticed that a lot with like fan theories of like what people want from the show where people just be like, that was that was like the impetus for like the Atlas ball. Yes, Um, I was just thinking. I don't know, okay, how many people watching this are like super invested in the Ruby fandom, but in the lead up to volume seven when they were going to Atlas, like sort of, just out of their asses, a bunch of people in the fandom were like, what if they have, like, a big formal ball in Atlas and everyone gets dressed up in, like, cool outfits and like or, like, you know, ball gowns and, like, tuxes and stuff? And people oh, I was were one like, of those people. there was so 100%. much, so much uh, theorizing and there was a lot of, like, fan art and stuff and people wrote, like, whole fix about it. And then, like, you know... It, this was based off of jack shit. It was just like, they're going to the fancy place. What if they did fancy things? Um, <laughs> like, literally, that was it, though. We're I mean, like, like they, you know, this is the perfect time. Let's and, do it. And it's like, I mean, I totally get it. Like, I would have liked an Atlas ball when they got everyone invited to, like, Jacques' house. I was kind of rooting for that. But, um, you know, those are new models you have to make. So it's kind of a pain. Um... Maria, I feel like you cringed especially hard in the early volumes. Are you with us on the comedy here? For sure. Like, they actually have jokes that hit. Excellent. Yeah. So, good good stuff. Good stuff. Finally getting comfortable with the writing a little bit. All right. We have some yanks to discuss. Ooh, yes. Ooh, the yanks. Here we go. Um, this is like... A huge going forward, this is gonna go in the discourse section because I feel like people get increasingly um mad about this or like they it just gets very contentious, especially in volume four. Um but this is this is the beginning of, of Yang being sad, and <laughs> I think there is there is much to discuss here. First of all, um the first moment that like really struck me in this volume as far as like Blake and Yang's relationship is the conversation after uh Yang gets as my friend who's watching the show right now put it uh framed for unsportsmanlike conduct. Um <laughs> yeah. where like you see like Blake seeing the hints of like all the stuff she recognized in Adam in Yang and like the more you know about it like the more heartbreaking it is. That the she's foils. Oh my god! Yes, foils. the foils. <laughs> yeah. Do, okay. Does someone else want to like speak to this? I feel like we all have a lot to say about. Yeah. Please. 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 All right. Let's just go around. Uh, Aaron. Okay. Oh my god. Wait. Where are we starting here? Because I actually now have to gather. <laughs> you have a lot. Actually, wait. You you gather your thoughts. Wish. Um. So like, I mean, I was just gonna say, as in regards to like the on sportsmanship, uh, being framed for on sportsmanship conduct, um. So like a lot of there's a lot of things that go into pinning Yang as um, like Adam's narrative foil, um, like their semblances, not their semblances, I guess. Uh, well, 
yeah, probably yeah. with them. Yeah, well, their semblances. Hundred percent. Their semblances are kind of like um, taking in power and then dishing it, dishing it back like twice as hard. And then you have like all of the like anger and stuff that Blake sort of starts to pick up on. But like, it, yeah, it's just good. It's just good. I just like it. It's good. Well, you just have like you go into this basically right with Blake directly comparing Yang and Adam. So, like, she already sets that up for you. She's like, I had a partner after this whole thing. And you're like, oh, uh -huh, we're all listening. This partner that you were romantically involved with. <laughs> who we're now comparing to Yang. Anyway. Um, so, it's like, she literally sets us up to, like, compare the two. And it's just, like, the more than you look at them, it's like, yes, yeah, so they, their semblances. Like, oh, I actually, I can't. I'm already, <laughs> I'm already, like, this You're is, already this getting is emotional. It. We're getting emotional. Excellent. We're crying in this club tonight. We are absolutely crying in the club. Um, Rio? Uh, I don't even know where to begin with all of this. Like... <laughs> we have too many feelings. <laughs> I know, Actually, we need to Okay, start one you know team. what? All right, Maria, you are like, I feel like you're the least in your feelings about this. Uh, yeah. Do you have takes? I'll let, I'll let you guys take it. <laughs> oh, like... okay. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. Um, okay, pick, give, us a, give us a scene. Give us a scene. We need like a focus point. Okay. Yeah. We're all just gonna weep. Oh my god. Okay. I have to like <laughs> corral this a bit. Yeah. So. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The first thing, Blake setting them up as foils for each other. Again, it just makes me so sad because it's just like she probably like really wants to like stand by Yang and trust her, but she's seen it happen before and she doesn't know if she can like. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, it's oh, just but, heartbreaking. Like, okay, so some of the only times we see Yang cry is when it's directly involving Blake, and yes. she, like, straight up started oh, crying my gosh. when Blake oh, didn't wait. believe her. Wait, isn't but it tears? The, I think the first time they ever animated tears were for that. Like, Blake, yeah. I mean, Yang crying at Blake, yeah. And it hit so hard. It <laughs> hit. It sure hit. Because, deeply. Like, out of everybody in that room, she... She thought that Blake would be the person who believed her the most, and then it wasn't that. Oh, she was just, God. Like, yeah, that moment. Devastated. Yeah. Stings. Yeah. Oh, God. You can. Soul crushing. It's like you can see how close they are to each other, but like they just can't. There's just too much there. They can't quite push through it, right? And like Blake yeah. even says, like, she wants to believe her. So like she's trying, but like it's hard for her to get over like the past. So. Yeah, understandably. Yeah, um, absolutely understandable. Okay, let's get into the scene. Um, oh, let's go. Let's, let's go. Let's go. Okay. All right. All right. All right. First of first of all, all right. Let's all right, Let's go. This is gonna this is gonna be a long slide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Taking this piece by piece. First of all, uh, Adam. Adam shows up. Um, Adam. Adam. <laughs> Adam. I have to. That vine is gonna get used every episode until he dies. We have to. Um, Wait, yes. So Can we back it up though to before Adam though, because like when they're even when they're separated, <laughs> oh, wait. they're they're You're talking right. on the phone. <laughs> yes, we have to discuss the phone. <laughs> the phone conversation. <laughs> the fact that they're always on the phone together, apparently. <laughs> Open line, one hundred percent of the time. <laughs> the fact that she sends wife's after Ruby and oh. not herself. Okay, I think about oh, that all the time. God. No, that you was would... such a sign. Oh my god, this. You would think. <laughs> You would think that she you would, would go after her sister, but she sends who she had taken like, care of her whole life. Oh my god, yes. I'm literally getting like flashbacks to the volume. Yes. Oh my god, when we were like trying to be like it's romantic. <laughs> my heart why. Rate has gone up. <laughs> oh my god, I know. Okay, we're, like we're so passionate because of that discourse. Like we, we are. That's why we <laughs> exactly we have to be like <laughs> we have these discussions. <laughs> Oh my god. I've activated yeah. something with this. You've activated it. You have like a sleeper agent. Triggered. All right. You've triggered us. You've triggered. Yeah. I've, I've activated the trap card. Um, yeah. Okay. You no, know it is. It's like, I, that was actually, I think, a big thing when, like, Yang shows up and she does, she's like, you look for Ruby and I'm going to go find Blake. Like, that was a big thing. I think, and we were all like, okay, hold on. That was a turning point. In that her was story. a turning point. Yeah. I, okay. That was still under the impression that like they weren't gonna go this route and then i'm pretty sure that rio called me when the the scene that we're about to talk about happened and they were like you have to you have to finish just hold out and finish the volume and i'm like okay and then i'm pretty sure i called them crying <laughs> so 
<laughs> yes, yes, I remember this vividly. <laughs> it checks out. Christ, yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Okay, <laughs> so, so, all right, Adam shows up. First of all, the minute he says, like, my darling or whatever, oh. Oh. Vomit. 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 <laughs> yes, physically un unwell. Is... Oh, yes. It has the same energy as Milady. Oh my god, <laughs> stop! I mean, the joke is that Adam is like an incel, so it kind of fits. Where is his <laughs> fedora? I was where literally just it? like, where is Adam's fedora? Well, he has yeah, like a- oh my god. If he had one, if he had yeah. a fedora, he would have tipped it as Yang came in screaming. <laughs> and he would have said, my lady, you're correct. Yeah, he no, have, no, he- yeah. he, he... We're gonna get so much shit from people who really like it. We're Adam being cancelled, <laughs> please drink. Uh, oh yeah, here, wait, that's just- now we all have to add another cancellation. <laughs> Christ. The people We there, triggered the Adam apologist. The the people <laughs> the at, Oh god, the Adam apologist that's a discourse slide for another episode. Um <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know how many Adam Well, okay, I spent like 20 minutes in two straight podcasts shitting on Jean and I didn't get anything from Jean fans. So like, I don't Yeah, but Adam fans are a different breed, they, you know? Like say are God. All right. You well, can like Adam, but you can't simp for Adam. You can like him as <laughs> exactly. a villain. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. All right. I got. I gotta keep this on track. So, right. Immediate. I mean. Okay. Here's the thing with Adam is that like the reason that so many people do like him is because like his design is really good. His fighting style looks cool. He has like and since. He was introduced in the black trailer where you see, like, almost nothing of him. Like, you get, like, the barest minimum characterization, but you know that him and Blake used to be close. And so you think, like, oh, like, you know, maybe there's some real potential here. Like, there's some, like, character that could evolve into something really, like, complicated and deep. And then he shows up and just is immediately, like, the skeeviest motherfucker you've ever seen. you're like, all right, I've had enough. <laughs> get oh. this guy off my screen. Yeah. Um, at least that's how I felt. But I get oh, yeah. But I get why people were invested in him in the first place. Cause I definitely like first saw him, I was like, ooh, this guy's gonna be like a cool villain who I'll wanna see a lot of. And yeah. as soon as he started talking, yeah. I changed my mind about that. It's always interesting to have like a villain who has like some sort of connection with like the main cast. But like I, I just yeah. Adam was be like because we didn't know a lot about him, it was more like we were anticipating something and then it ended up changing, I guess. I don't know. I never really liked Adam that much. I liked his design. Yeah, his design was really he, cool. he didn't do anything for me ever at any point. I was like, he's going to be bad probably. <laughs> And then I like. Left I mean, I mean, in the trailer, Blake literally leaves him after he yeah. tries to use her as a meat shield. So like, yeah, did he did change? Sense. Like, he is the villain. Ooh. Like, he's always been the villain. That's a good point. Yeah, Go back, yeah, literally. Like, that's I, how he was introduced. He set it up. Yeah, I, yeah. Th I think another element with Adam is just like, let let's be real. Uh, bitches love EI Jutsu. It just looks cool. Like, why do you think? It, uh, it does. Why do you think Ruroni Kenshin was so popular for so long? Like, come yeah, on. Yeah, true. Um. Okay. He shows up. Uh. Him and okay. God, watching Blake in that fight, it's so sad. Ooh, it's painful. It's, it is hard to watch. Um. And then Yang shows up. The primal scream. The tears. Oh my the god. The tears. The Stop tears. It. Oh, Blake okay, wait, no, wait, 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 no. wait, 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 there's so much to discuss here, hold on okay, a second. Okay, holy shit. You, you've made a mistake putting all three of us on this specific You did, that's <laughs> true, this was like, uh, okay. This section alone is gonna be two hours. God, <laughs> just, gonna... just wait until volume six. Oh yeah, oh, that's God. Like God. hours. It's gonna be that's four gonna be like, hours. That's gonna be episode. <laughs> Max asked okay. me if I wanted to be on volume six, and I was just like, you know what, you can let the bees have that one. <laughs> oh. Okay, You're... I'm gonna get I'm gonna try to go through my thoughts Ma as fast Maria, as possible. Maria just doesn't want to play knife cat. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. This is all right, I think... Maria, this is my revenge for getting T posed on all those months. <laughs> me and having all of my fandom friends for Ruby be black sun shippers. Yes. <laughs> you guys won in the end. <laughs> oh. uh, okay. It was like Okay. Yes, Aaron. Oh no, go sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So the thing that, like, oh, God, where do I even start with this? 
<laughs> First of all, are we trying to talk about the scene? Yes, is that this what we're doing? Scene. Okay, wait. All right, I've got it. Aaron's like, I got this. I've got. It. I have. I'm trying to. Get, I'm going to try and like go through my thoughts like in a linear, concise order as quickly as possible because I know we are going to be on this for an hour. So okay. So first of all, thoughts. Adam and Blake, their whole fight, like watching that, you are like, this is a woman who has been deeply traumatized by this particular person. Yes. Right? Like, there's yeah. there's like literally no point where you're like, oh, they are exes having a disagreement. You are like, mm, this is this is uh, getting into some very heavy, dark territory. Yeah. Like, just in the fight. And then, of course, he's like, I'm going to fucking stab you. And you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, he tries to kill her. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, clearly this is, you know, this guy is an abusive freak there's a lot so, of if i can't have you no one can yes on there's yes. possessive possessive that is exactly the vibe here yeah but like literally like literally like i will kill you so that yeah i cannot have you basically is what's happening there but like his what's he say when he okay the line as he's just before he stabs her Where um, is he i'm gonna or which one um, the one where he says that he's going to destroy everything yes. she loves. Starting oh, with yeah. her. Starting with her. It's like, okay. hmm. This is literally, I saw this scene in a gift set and I was like, holy shit. This is so gay. I have to watch it <laughs> yeah. immediately. Like, this is where, yeah, this is where real This is the me. gift set that made me watch the show. <laughs> it was like me seeing him say that shit. And then like this scene and I was like, what the fuck? Like they did it. Like they're doing it. It's happening. Like, yeah. It is because like the thing is that like that was not even first of all, you know this is like a hugely important poignant scene. Right? Like this scene is setting up literally years of narrative development for these characters. And yep. so and thinking about it, so you're like, okay, every word of the scene was thought very carefully. Like every word of this their dynamic so far. So it's like there's the fact that they chose the words that they chose, I remember that being like the, such yeah. a huge point of discourse too. Like the fact that he kept calling Blake my love, the fact that he was like starting with her, you know, everything you love starting with her. Like all of these things were so purposeful and setting this up that, and it was so well done. Like it wasn't even subtext, like this was text. And like, yes, I think a lot of the discourse too that was happening around that time was like, well, like, if if son had gone, then it would have been the same thing. But I'm like, but he didn't go. <laughs> but he didn't. But like the, there was, I just think that like from a writing standpoint, there would have been a reason for like either to have son or Yang go. And the way that it went, it just felt like it was leaning more towards that. And up until that point, I was on, under the impression that it was gonna be Black Sun that was gonna happen. And then Rio convinced me to watch that, and I was like, you were right. <laughs> you were yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I had read into the subtext of the foils that were being set up with Blake and when she was like drawing out Adam in like season two, I think, when she was drawing his like mm -hmm. symbol and stuff. And then when they had the conversation and burning the candle, like I had already read into this and then it all like came to a front in this episode and I lost my mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are so many fucked up things about this scene, too. Like, the fact that the energy Adam uses to cut off Yang's arm is from Blake's weapon. Yeah. I didn't notice that. And he uses yes. her shots to charge his semblance. Yeah, it's like he uses yeah. her shot, and then he, he uses it to cut off Yang's arm. Like, that, I mean, there are so many, like, little things that they did like this. But, I mean, overall, like, the whole, like, the this scene, like, literally connects these characters together, like, forever essentially like yeah, obviously this, there's never going to be a time in which they're not intimately deeply connected from what happened like, like this, this trauma is like this is like a defining moment for both of their character arcs yeah too, because a lot of what happens in that scene directly impacts how they go on for like the rest of the show so exactly like, yeah they're very intertwined at that point yes absolutely. yeah like literally for years after this like oh uh, absolutely I'm like, my my I'm like going through it right now. <laughs> it's good. It's good. This is how you. This is how you get good podcast content. Um, right. Okay. Everything you love. I feel like everything you love, starting with her, is the beginning of the. What was the joke? Homophobic ally, Adam Taurus. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that like, yeah. I. Okay. You know what's so funny? I was. I'm watching. Um. Uh. Buffy the Vampire Slayer with Mercedes right now, and there's a scene with there with um. Oh God, who is it? It's Willow and Tara, the the like lesbian witches on that show, where like Willow's 
X recognizes that they were, like, an actual thing before anyone else. Like, everyone else is completely oblivious, but he figures it out pretty quickly after, like, a day of being around them. And it's, like, I think there's a certain... It speaks to something very real in the sense that, like, a, like, an X who is not over you is, like, going to be the most paranoid out of everyone mm. and is going to see, mm -hmm. like, romantic rivalry in every direction. So, like, of all the people to recognize this first, like, yeah, it would be Adam. Like, it makes yeah, it makes yeah. a certain degree of sense. Oh, my God. I feel like I, feel like I just fought in a war. Like, just... I'm, like, so emotional. Um, Other heartbreaking parts of this is just seeing them, like, after after Blake runs away. Okay, first of all, they really went to great lengths to like actually show the shot of like Blake's shadow clone getting her head cut off just to like freak you yeah. out for a second. Because oh, you're because yeah. you're still to not freak you out, but also to cement the fact that Adam was out to kill Blake. Yeah. Yes. But it's like it's one of those things where like you're not over Penny yet, so you're not sure what yeah. like how many rules they're gonna bring. Like, are they just gonna fucking kill Blake here? Like, is this happening <laughs> for like a split second? But I remember too. There being a bunch of yang. <laughs> there was like a bunch of discourse too over whether or not like Blake also cloned Yang, because yeah. people were like, "Well, how did he not notice like that they were both missing? Like, how did he not notice Yang's body just disappear?" So I remember that being a talking point for like a really long time. That's interesting. I didn't think about that. That's one of those things where it's like, it's like, yeah, that is kind of a. a question but also is like small enough that i'm not going to take like tremendous issue with it yeah it's like it's filed under like that's in like cinema sins territory at that point i feel One of those like little fun things yeah exactly. like maybe that moment she's so emotional she just cloned everything she was like fuck it <laughs> a rocky forgot um exactly uh okay so what else is there to talk about here after they escape seeing like them laying next to each other on the ground on like the Oof. helipad or whatever me and Rio have a lot to say about that scene, but oh, it's going to get yeah. in the Black Sun discourse, so we're not going to do it. I won't get into discourse, but I do want to say that, like, because what you, Max, said about Adam and him being the first to notice their thing together, like, their connection, I think that the scene where Sun is in the background and he sees them on the ground and Blake crying and saying she's so sorry and holding Yang's other hand that's still mm -hmm. connected to her, um, and seeing how they're literally connected after this big traumatic event happened, I think that that scene is really important in Sun's story because he realizes yeah. how connected they are. And he knows that he still wants to help Blake and he still cares about her. And he just wants to be there for his friend or if they became something more, like he wanted to be there for her. And that's like so important. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a reason why like, one of my favorite AUs for these characters is uh, Sun is like uh, Blake's wingman because like that's really yeah. what he what he's about in the next couple seasons. Yeah, just pretty much helping her get back on her feet. I think that he definitely like he goes into Volume Four with like the intention of just helping. Like he just wants to be there for her, and if something happens, then something happens. That's that's it. He's a good dude. So yeah, I agree with that too. Um. Okay. The thing in this whole uh, series of events that, like, really hit me the hardest. I don't know why this was the point where I was just like, oh, shit, this is real, isn't it? Was um the last scene where Ruby is talking to Yang and she has just lost all hope. Um, mm -hmm. And when she's yeah. talking about what happened, how, like, she doesn't even really, like, I mean, obviously, she's torn up about losing her arm. Like, that goes without saying. But the fact that the thing that gets to her the most is that no. Blake ran away. <laughs> yep. Yep. You, can, yep. you can, like, yep. hear it. Barbara Dunkelman, man, turned it she, out this volume. Because you, she can, did. you can just hear the agony in her voice as soon as she says, and Blake left. And Blake ran. That's she the moment ran. that you're like, oh, that's it. Because, like, everything else, she's so monotone, basically, up until... That point, like she like trembles on Pierre's name a little bit, but like when she says, "And Blake ran," there's, like the emotion. Yeah, she's there's angry like anger. The, yeah, there. she's really sad. Yeah, it's like um, that is the thing that is tearing her up. Well, it's because like, it's because like she 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 lost an arm for her, so she's like, "Well, why yes. wasn't she here when I woke up?" Oh like, what? God. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's the worst part. 
Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. That feel when no goth cat girl GF. Uh, <laughs> during the fight with Adam, Blake says, like, I'm not going to run away. And Adam oh, says, and, you will. And then, and she, then does. she does. Oh, and she does. Yeah. Oh, so fucked up. It's so fucked up. So fucked up. Well, we will have a lot more to talk about with that in the next couple of volumes. So stay <laughs> stay tuned, everyone, for more uh, Bumblebee freakouts. Because there's... <laughs> Considering the composition of this uh, this podcast's uh, panels, you got a lot of that to look forward to. All right, other high points in Volume 3, of which there are so many. Uh, first of all, fucking Jean is no longer fucking Jean. He's now just Jean. He's a pretty cool guy. Yeah. He's, he gets a lot better this <laughs> yeah. volume. Um, Maria, I feel like <laughs> we filibustered you a bit on that last slide. You want to talk about Jean a little bit? Yeah, he's he's not annoying anymore. He's I think he's like humbled out a little bit. Um, he had some good conversations with Pira, so we get to know more like about him um, and his motivations. Um, and then obviously the whole gut punch that is Pira. Um, my feelings toward Jean completely changed in this volume. We we don't he he's not cringe anymore. He finally has his um his his moment in the Pro ZD video. He's like the Benji yes. you knew is no more. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. is he is no yeah. longer peeing and pooping his pants. <laughs> Thank God. And the fact that like he the, the conversation with Pira during um I think it's when she's holding the cotton candy and like he doesn't know what she's going through, but he's like trying to help and giving her like telling her. If, what does he say about, like, destiny and, like, you know, you have to keep trying or something? Or, like, the Pira I know would way. never yeah. back down. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, you get a sense that he, like, actually has been absorbing some of these, like, moments he's been having with Pira, where before, I For feel sure. like you get a little bit of the sense, especially because he's at, like, you know, harem protagonist levels of dense in terms of her dropping hints at him and him just not picking up on them. Lord. But, like, at the very... <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't, we don't need to turn this into the the Comedy Central roast of Wish. Um, but, but um, Christ, uh, yeah. So so seeing that he actually has been like you know he he has connected with her in like a meaningful way, just not in like the one specific way. Um, and like I mean I can't even blame him for that too much because like I mean if you if you were like the biggest clown on the cast, would you think the hottest girl in school had a thing for you, even if she was being really obvious about it? Mm, probably not. I don't know. Um, yeah. So Jean Jean's much better this volume. Um, so much better. The music still slaps. Oh, the music. Yeah. It's so good. I like, okay, I've expressed before that I am not a huge fan of Ruby music, but it definitely has its moments. And I think all of the like, every time it's used in a fight in this volume, I think it is just like A+. plus. Yes, especially Absolutely. the velvet scene. The velvet yeah. scene. Really oh, cool. yes. That, there's never been a better combination of they music can never scene. top that yeah <laughs> it's just never gonna happen um i also oh yeah we talked about this a little bit before how like the the horn remixes or like the jazzy remixes of all the songs for the mm. funky fight were really clever yeah i just some sad remixes too oh there yeah there are some yeah. really sad remixes i think it was um oh god i'm trying to remember which scene it was that had like the sad like piano like um uh, version of I Burn where you can hear the melody but it's like really really slow and tragic and I, I thought that was a nice uh, is that isn't that the Adam cool. scene? no it, like after? after? it's either a after the Mercury Merc thing. yes it was after the Mercury fight yeah oh yes it's where You're she's right. crying about like not believing her but yeah yeah Hearing, like, such, like, a triumphant, like, mm -hmm. confident song turned into this really tragic, like, uh, piano number is just very... Like, that's a, that's a nice touch. I appreciate the late motifs in this show. Yeah. I have joked that this the music is butt rock for people who like musicals. But you know what? Musicals have some rights. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> some. Some. They have some. I'm not going to be too generous there. Theater kids, you were not off the hook. Um, <laughs> Invalidating I, theater kids, love it. Yes, absolutely. Canceled. Canceled. <laughs> uh, 
Christ. No. It's our turn to do the canceling. <laughs> <laughs> and then when everyone's canceled, no one will be. <laughs> um, Maria, you want to talk about how fucking hard Ironwood's robot reveal slaps? It was really funny that during the Battle of Beacon, nobody else's clothes really get tattered. Except for Ironwood, <laughs> who we can con- conveniently reveal that his, he's half robot. Like, you know, part of his shirt's gone, his pants are ripped, like, and nobody else has any scratches on them. That's kind it's of because of his second job where he's a stripper at night, so he wears tear away clothes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it's, I find, you know, I just realized. Iron Daddy. Iron Daddy. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like it's proto Iron Daddy, but like it's the 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 seeds are there. I have joked in the past. Yeah. I think I've said this before about how like I am the worst at figuring out which male characters people will think are hot, but I completely get it with Ironwood, with like the people who are into him. Like there there are some seeds, especially like the one where he just like some grim is charging at him and he just casually pulls out his revolver and like shoots it out of the air without even looking <laughs> he at him. Just like damn. He's a cool character, um, yeah. at least in, like, that respect, like, the weapons and, like, the fact that he is part robot, yeah. Oh, man. I just realized Ironwood getting all his clothes torn off for that is, like, inadvertently, like, a weird um, subversion of, like, anime tropes where, like, girls are getting their clothes torn off constantly. (laughs) And in this (laughs) show, that happens to none of the girls and one dude. And it's plot Second relevant. For that. Respect. Get some man service in there, you know? That's what we're talking about. It's not what I'm here for, but I respect it. Um, okay. Also, lots of, plenty of foreshadowing in this volume. So many things to come. I think we've already, like, touched on that a lot with, like, Cinder's speech. Mm-hmm. Um, the nature of, like, this is the beginning of Ironwood's, like, paranoia really sitting in. Um, whereas before it was just kind of hinted at, um, or like the conflict between Oz and Ironwood really starts to boil over here. Yeah, um, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus like crow stuff. Oh mm-hmm. yes. Plenty of things with crow. I love the scene with, um, him and Ironwood where it looks like crow's about to attack Ironwood, but he's actually killing a grim behind him. He's like, I know you didn't do any of this. Oh yeah. yeah. Some good stuff. You know what? Hot take. Iron Crow has rights. Yeah. Oh my god, my friend have, is gonna love you friend. for that. Yeah, and I was <laughs> would be really happy She's to gonna lose that. her shit when she hears you say that. <laughs> Glad I can make someone happy on this podcast. <laughs> this one's for like you, gay Anna. Crow. <laughs> gay Crow and happiness with maybe yes. maybe Iron Woman when he calms down. Maybe Just, when he has yeah. some therapy. Just, Iron would need therapy ASAP. I mean, they like all need therapy, honestly. But... Yeah, actually. Okay, true. <laughs> Crow needs to stop having sexual tension with like cops. <laughs> You're so, so right. right. <laughs> You're so correct. Yes. Uh, I it's... didn't realize that, but you're right. <laughs> it's sad, but it's true. Well, okay, it's because it's like it's an unfortunate uh side effect of like crow having narrative foils in the sense that he's like you know the like chaotic drunk like fuck the rules guy i'm doing whatever i want like i'm not going to be held down by your order so of course his foils are all of like you know the like authoritarian types um oh we are gonna find you like a nice librarian or something dude (laughs) (laughs) god um but yeah also speaking of crow we get like the tiniest hints of team stark um, which we learn a little bit more about going forward, but it's fun Kirby, to get, like... give me the Forbidden Stark lore. <laughs> yes. That's coming one day, I know it. Yeah. Stark when? Let's go. I think the real question with Stark is, um, Tai Yang impregnated two of his teammates. So, like, what are the odds that he tried going three for three? <laughs> Probably high. Very high. I feel like that definitely, it probably didn't work out long. It, it probably was one of those things where like it happened like once or twice and they're like, all right, there's nothing really here. But it de- they definitely tried it, I feel like. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Um, as fun as it is to gush about this volume, because it is like all of one of our favorites, um, there are plenty of critiques to level, as is always the case with Ruby. So let's, let's get into some critiques. First of all, um, 
Exposition is still a huge struggle on the show. I feel like of all the things that have improved over the seasons, this is one that hasn't changed all that much. And in particular, I think this is the beginning of the show's bad habit of, like, just aggressive info dumping. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, The end of World of Remnant created a whole new beast. Yeah, well, it's like they can't shunt the lore off into this, like, side series now. So it's like, no, it, it has to all go in the main show. But they still don't know how to, like, lay it out um, in a way. Again, I think this is, it does come back a little bit to, like, the limits of having a 15-minute show with, like, yeah. just this ridiculous amount of world building you have to cram into it. Um, I don't know. Maria, do you want to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, and the fact that we have, like, you know... It's taken us three seasons for the plot to start, and the plot is now starting. You have to cram that all in. There's just a lot. It does kind of make you wonder, like, where was some of this stuff earlier? Like, you feel like right. like they they could have dropped this in, like, in past volumes, maybe. Like, there was, like, when you consider how many episodes were spent on, like, Jean experiencing that feel when no girlfriend. <laughs> Neptune can't <laughs> dance. Yeah. yeah. Just like saved yeah. by the bell ass problems. It's like, wait, we could have been like, couldn't we have been talking about the maidens a little earlier? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I feel like that is something that they struggle with in large part because the the time is so limited. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, were the world of remnants happening around this volume? I can't remember. No, they stopped. But like, uh... honestly, for me, I'm kind of disappointed in that because it's such a short show. Like, I didn't like World of Remnant because it's a ridiculous concept instead of just putting it in the show. However, taking those away and just trying to cram it all into the show in the same type of way where it's just like a random cut off into like a storybook style animation yeah. in the middle of an episode doesn't really work very well and i would prefer it being a separate thing if they have to do it that way yeah and that has a lot to do with like the the length of the episodes too though yeah but it does definitely feel a lot of times where it's like oh we're just doing a world of remnant episode now like they just it's it's just not a separate series anymore they just crammed it into the show Mm mm-hmm um, there's other weird exposition stuff in terms of, like, for example, uh, Winter explains Weiss's semblance to Weiss, who is, like, the one person who would actually know how it works, when you feel like yeah. that probably could have been explained to someone who doesn't know how it works. Like, that's sh- that scene is, like, nice because you get, like, um, like, Weiss and Winter, like, developing their relationship a little bit, but then that happens, you're kind of like, like, wait, you're just doing this clearly for the audience's benefit. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I feel like they could have explained to us the, the summoning in a very different and more meaningful way and just let them have that, like, sisterly moment without trying to give us narrative I feel like somebody just, could have, like, asked Winter or Weiss during the tournament, like, yes. oh, gee, what, what is her semblance like? <laughs> and, like? I mean, honestly, they could have just had Weiss summon in the end, in the fall of Beacon, and everyone be like, whoa, what the fuck was that? And then, yeah, she and then explain, explain it later. It. Yeah. I like, could she could have explained it in, like, a really grand, like, anime-esque type of way where <laughs> she's, like, summoning and she's like, oh, by the way, I could do this. That would have been cool. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, like someone, it's like someone does something crazy, like, ah, you, you see, you don't understand the power of my stand. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right. Oh, there was one. Oh, yeah. Some. This is like incredibly nitpicky, but it still kind of bugs me. Is that Weiss in that conversation with Winter makes a big deal out of how she's mastered time dilation, and then she never uses time dilation ever again. Yeah. Oh, that's that's such a that's 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 like it's it's a true Iraqi forgot moment. And they were just like mm-hmm. she can cast haste for two volumes, and then just sort of never brought it up again. Uh, it's it's unfortunate where he's like you have so many moving parts that some stuff just ends up getting lost in the shuffle and that was one of them yeah. but it was one of the few things that they drew attention to in the dialogue we see a lot of her using her like her glyphs as like platforms and to like propel people but we don't see her use the haste thing that much anymore yeah i think weiss also my one 
again, this is weird, like, nitpicky stuff, but I think Weiss's semblance is the one that, like, it kind of feels like it does whatever they want it to do for the purposes of the plot at times, where there's mm -hmm. such a wide range of abilities she could use it for, um, that, like, there are definitely moments where it's like, okay, you're just making shit up as you go. Even the <laughs> summoning, to some yeah. extent, feels like they wanted to do that. It's like, how many Final Fantasy-ass abilities can we cram into her semblance? That's it's true. I feel like that's why they would make her be, like, the worst fighter, though, is because, like, she's so OP that they're like, well, you have to just lose every battle then, because we just made shit up for you. They had to nerf wise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OP, Blizz, please nerf. <laughs> No, Weiss is just a uh, third edition D&D &D wizard where she has to be complete dog shit for her first 10 levels so that she can be way better than everyone else when she gets, like, to the higher levels. You are you so go. right. Pretty much. <laughs> it's, an, it's an exponential curve. God, uh, now I want to play D&D. &D. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um. Okay, another thing. This is something that I kind of go back and forth on where... Like, okay, Ruby's silver eyes moment where we finally learn what that even means and she, you know, uh, freezes the the, dra the wyvern or whatever it's called. Um, like, okay, there is the scene at the very, very beginning where Ozpin says, you have silver eyes, which makes us think like, okay, I mean, if, you were, if you're assuming that that isn't just some like early volume weirdness that they're gonna forget about later because there was a lot of that like it does indicate that you have to pay attention to that but the question is like how much of a deus ex machina is her just pulling that out because the idea that the silver eyes are in any way meaningful for like um any kind of like combat or that like silver eyes means that you're like really good against the grim or like anything along those lines like that is all thrown in afterwards like does this feel satisfying to people the first time I through. had I had some mixed feelings about that because like up until that well there's a lot of issues of power scaling in this show too because like you like you have one big bad that always outdoes the other one and is more big bad than that one but like Cinder up until that point was like a serious serious threat and I thought that she was going to stay a serious serious threat for longer but then Ruby just sort of immediately counterbalanced that and I was like, ah, so we've established her as a, a big threat. And then we just immediately took that away. <laughs> so I, I don't know how I felt, felt about that, but. Mm, yeah, I think I also had mixed feelings about it because like, I guess what you said, but I think it was interesting in the sense that like we, nobody knew anything about it, including like Ruby herself. So it's not like she unlocked something that was instantly OP that she could then use from then on. Like, we've seen her just, like, struggle with it, honestly. And it only comes out at maybe, like, very, very necessary moments. And sometimes not even then. Cough, so... cough, season finale, can't do it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah, well, it's just, it's like... I mean, that's what it means, like, early on. Like, I mean, it makes a little more sense once they start explaining it. But it kind of feels like, oh, like, the plot demands that she has to nuke the Grim. Like, just, get, like, she can do it now. Y'all ever think about how there's a giant stone dragon just attached to just the chilling. Chicken Tower? Yeah. Literally just <laughs> yeah, vibing. Y'all ever vibing. think about how it just came out of a mountain for no reason that's not explained? It was vibing. <laughs> <laughs> it was interrupted. Speaking of the Grim, um, we touched on this a little bit before when we were talking about how um, the Grim start to feel like a real threat this volume. Um, one thing that I think about a lot is like, Okay, because there's a line where Ironwood says, like, the Grim are becoming more dangerous or, like, they're starting to, like, become more aggressive or something. I don't think that's really communicated up to this point. Like, we see them get more aggressive after everything goes down at the fall of Beacon. But the idea that this was, like, a looming threat that people were aware of, it feels like that really comes out of nowhere here. I think the only time I can think of that they somewhat hinted at it was when... Team Coffee gets back from their mission in Volume 2. And they're talking about how there were just so many and it took them so much longer. Like, I think that's the mm. only, like... And I think that, again, that's like, just, like, one of the flaws of the show in, in this structure and not having time is that they... The things that they needed to foreshadow versus the time that they had to do it, it's just, like... It's not balanced very well. So you really have to be looking at everything with a very specific eye to kind of put it all together. And I just... I don't think... Yeah, I don't think it it kind of connects the way they always want it to. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. 
There's also a lot of just random nitpicky things that I take issue with in this volume. First of all, actually, Maria, you have some thoughts on this. Um, the incredibly fuzzy distinction between dust semblances and now magic. Way early on to be like, magic isn't real. Magic doesn't exist. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of the, the magic system isn't very well developed. And, you know, instead of one thing, you have all these things that are kind of connected but kind of not, and just the way they're explained is not very, uh, not very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And it only kind of gets even more so in the later seasons, um, with, like, Maiden Bowl and stuff. It's kind of, and, and it definitely lends into the whole power creep thing. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's confusing. Yep. I think they all just also, yeah. like, they look the same. Like, they all look yes. really similar. Like, you can't, you know, like, I, I... It took me a while I wouldn't to necessarily out know a semblance from magic semblance if I was. didn't. Yeah, like yeah. if I didn't already know what their semblances were, I would be like, this looks just like magic. Like, so it yeah. is very. I mean, it's explained later that like semblances and dust are just basically smaller versions of the magic that people used to have. So, like, yeah. is there actually a distinction here or like what? I like think it's yeah. Are they also intertwined? I think that what that it's serves to muddy. do, yeah, what that serves to do is it's like okay, well, that explains why they all look kind of similar. But really, what that does is just undercut how like um, crazy the maiden powers are supposed to be, and that it's like oh, it's just a bigger version of the stuff we already have, essentially. Yeah, it doesn't feel super unique in the way that like it's shocking to people. Mm -hmm. Another thing I kind of take issue with in this volume is uh, Pyrrha's death, again, not from like an emotional or a thematic level where I think it works really well, but from a purely narrative perspective. Um, okay, I have a bit of a rant on this. Basically, like, okay, when Cinder comes in and shoots the old Fall Maiden to steal her powers, she gets the Full Maiden powers, and then Ozpin is like, all right, you need to get out of here the tower cannot fall. What the fuck does he mean by that? Because after he fights Cinder and loses, apparently, which, like, again, that goes back to Wish's thing about power scaling, where it's like, oh, she's just completely unkillable here, and then later on she kind of gets owned a little bit. But, like, um... After he has that fight with her, she then goes up to the tower. She's just, like, chilling in his office, I guess, waiting for the wyvern to fly by so that she can just, like, look hot standing next to it. <laughs> and then Pyrrha comes up, presumably to defend the tower, as Ozpin said. And then, like, yeah, Cinder, like, loses in the end because Ruby, like, silverizes her out of the picture but you would think that like if the whole island or the whole floating complex or whatever is covered in grim that like like the tower did fall like they literally broke it so and then because like presumably the reason he says the tower can't fall is like we later learn about the relics presumably that's where the relic is but then it's like okay well the tower fell so shouldn't they have found the relic by now oh no we hid the relic somewhere really safe so no one's gonna be able to find it it's like well then what were you worried about the tower for so i don't worry about that but i don't think anyone's it. motivations in this sequence make any goddamn sense and i think knowing that they wanted pira to die from the very beginning it feels a little bit even though like the payoff is emotionally satisfying it feels a little bit like um they're doing that thing right sometimes do where they have a set conclusion in mind and they are essentially just shuffling around the characters like game pieces trying to get them to line up in the certain way um but like not really what without like a really satisfying coherent explanation for why they've lined up in this fashion yeah you're right i mean for me i was always under the impression that the tower was the communications tower and if it fell it mean that they have no communication with anyone that's on Ozpin's secret army, basically. But the power thing with him and Cinder is really confusing for me because Ozpin is, like, technically supposed to be somewhere around Salem's power level based on, like, 
what we know about them now. Like, he's probably less powerful because he didn't get dunked into a grim thing, grim <laughs> ocean, whatever, and he's not part grim. But, like, how could he lose against Cinder, who is brand new maiden and, like, doesn't know how to use the powers very well? I and thought... then, like, ten minutes later, she gets owned by Ruby's eyes. Well, I thought we learned that Ozpin was less powerful now because he gave so much of his power away. That wasn't the point. Like, he gave it to the maidens and also to Crow and Raven. Oh, and yeah. Of <laughs> that would make I mean, that's possible. That would yeah, make sense. I just... I don't know if it was ever explained I that, don't know if like, he's that really, point. truly, like, not powerful anymore. It was just, like, oh, he gave other people these things. The but, stuff like, with... it was never explained that he's less powerful because of it. The stuff of the power scaling bothers me less than just, like, the, the lack of, like, clear motivations for the tower or whatever. I don't know. I think it's because we aren't clear on exactly, like, what, what that, like, what the tower is. Like, what, yeah. it, what it conveys. Like, I just... yeah. I, yeah, like, I, I actually never really even, like, thought about that line, because I was just, I just thought it was like, well, of course you don't want, you know, the communication and just, like, the symbolism of just a beacon, like, <laughs> of the hope to, like, to topple. So but... because, because we mentioned Salem, I just want to, like, slide this in. Uh, we we did get the, the finishing touches of the conversation between Salem and Ozpin, but we kind of forgot to mention that in the good, so. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm, yeah. It is important. Um, um, sorry, Aaron. No, no, that's okay. I don't try to remember what I was. I mean, saying. I think it's one of those things where it's like this kind of reminds me of the conversation in the last episode about the stolen dust, where it feels like something where if they just added in like a little throwaway line to make it a little clearer as to what is going on with the tower, mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't get so. I hung mean, up I feel like it. they tried to, but it just didn't hit. Yeah. Because, like, after he says that, we get, I think it's Ruby. Well, it's one of them who says, oh, the, the tower's down and we can't communicate and all our devices aren't working. Oh, yeah. But then they go straight into, like, the next narrative piece. So it's, like, it is it is a very fast throwaway line and it really doesn't give us, like, the full grasp of, like, why it's so bad. Mm. Yeah, I think maybe I was just getting hung up on, like, thinking about the relic where it's like, well, yeah. if she's going to Beacon, wouldn't she be going there for the relic? So why isn't she looking for that? Like, I think that's what's really bothering me is the fact that I, okay, I don't have like a source for this, so I could be wrong, but I think the relics were something they added in later. Like they weren't planning on that in this volume. They introduced it in volume four when they thought of it. Um, so like, which would make sense because they're never referred to here, even though it's like, well, the villains are going to Beacon. So yeah, they'd be looking for the relic, right? And they're in a vault and the relic at Haven is in a vault. Yeah, that's where the, that's where the relic should be, is where Cinder yeah. was, where she got the powers from the old Fall Maiden. Cinder does mention that like, they couldn't find the relic. Like, so I guess she was looking for it, but she mentions that in like a later volume. Yeah, um, yeah. It feels... I feel like her main purpose was getting the entire maiden powers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it... and I mean, it, I guess it would make sense for me. I mean, I don't. This is all going to like conjecture, and like you know, maybe Salem knowing that relic was under the protection of Ozpin was probably like this is not going to be the one to start with. You know what I mean? Like this is probably be more complicated than say like freaking out Leo and making him give us a relic or whatever. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Though I, think, knows. I could see that. I think that yeah. though that I think that does fall under the category of like the writers aren't doing any of that work for you. Oh yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um all right. Other stuff. The animation is noticeably better in this volume than in the past, but it's still kind of jank in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 2D the concept walking art. cycle is still not good. The 2D <laughs> yep. concept art. The news yeah, like, oh, oh yeah, too. and some of the some of the vital festival attendees, um, the news people, the news people just, piss like, me off so much. Cutie person that blinks. Yeah, that was rough. Yeah, I mean, I guess like to be fair to the animation, um, I know the crew wanted to switch for a while, but Monty did not want to switch because oh. he was so oh, yeah, this oh, is oh, oh we'll get into poster. that. That's a yeah. whole other slide. That is a whole other um, other. 
very small nitpicks is the fact that they made having silver eyes a big deal and then gave people gray eyes. Like, come on, man. <laughs> That's just sloppy. That's, That's sloppy. If you're going to make that a big deal, you can't just be handing out like, oh, oh no, those are gray. It's like slightly different. If you, if you like put it into Photoshop and use the eyedropper or whatever, you can tell. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Ruby's silver eyes isn't very consistent. Like, sometimes they're a lot darker than they are in other scenes. And I could see, like, if we want to have, you know, light gray. Okay, this is silver. Dark gray. This is gray. But they don't even have that. Like, there's no discernible difference that you mm. can tell by looking at them. It feels a little bit like uh, Pittsburghers getting hung up on, like, no, it's black and gold. It's like, come on. Like, on the pants, they look yellow. Like, let's be <laughs> real here. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> um, final nitpick. Uh, does Ty have a job or is he just gardening full time now? Gardening. He's been through so much. <laughs> just let him grow some cabbage or whatever. My cabbages. His cabbages. Or his sunflowers. It's all connected. <laughs> everything's connected i someone someone had the best take on twitter where they're like tai yang is just the um the 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 boomer meme of like i just want to grill for god's sakes but instead of grilling it's gardening <laughs> absolutely yeah i heard i had canon tai as like a uh, hippie swinger guy who like just wants to garden and like smoke weed <laughs> he's mostly left alone he's like i'm so tired i <laughs> Dude's been through a lot, man. He's had very he's lost two wives now. He's had very bad luck with wives. <laughs> yeah, like oh. his vegetables aren't gonna leave him. Yeah. Oh man, give the man a break. What okay, we have discourse. There's mm. so so much of it. Okay, so here's where we'll get uh, canceled a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know what? That's, again, that's half the fun of this podcast, is just saying things that you know will make someone on social media very, very upset. I'm uh, ready. Okay. Get your drinks ready. This one's going to be a doozy. First, th we're, al we're already two hours into the podcast, so this one's going to last a long time. Okay. So first point of contention here is that, like, Volume 3, like, permanently split the fan base in several ways that really, like, haven't... It, it, they're, like, open wounds that have never healed. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for this. The first reason is just the huge tone shift that the show hits you with very much out of left field. Um, and I think, the fa like, okay, a lot of people really liked this. I really liked this. I think mm -hmm. everyone on this podcast really liked it. Yep. But a lot of people took issue with it. There were a lot of people who say, like, the show isn't fun anymore, who will say, like, I've encountered many people online who dropped the show after Penny died specifically because they were so mad with her death. Um, that's so funny. Yeah, that's, well, a few of them actually got back into it in Volume 7, and they actually had a, they had a really good time with it. Um but there were a lot of, like, people were real mad about the direction this show took, where it wasn't just this sort of, like, goofy, over-the-top, like, wacky show anymore. Um, and so I want to talk a bit about, like, do people feel like, A, this was the best way to go about this? <laughs> And B, like, if not, like, was there an approach that wouldn't have gotten people this mad? Or was this just sort of an inevitability? Um, Maria, do you want to address this a little bit? Who has been pretty vocal about, like, how hard it is to watch. I can kind of understand dropping it after this season if you're like me and you're, like, pretty averse to... Like, you know, everything going to shit kind of scenes and character deaths and just suffering. Um, but this, like, I think really, in my opinion, the better, like, the more the prevailing opinion is that this is where it actually, you know, gets good. Because, like, there are stakes now. We we know, like, there's plot. Um, we know who the big villain is. Um, and, you know, they've, they've raised the stakes. They've killed people. So I, I, I'm more of the, like, it hooked, it hooks you 
kind of narrative, but I can also see why someone would drop it. Especially after... Because it doesn't really ever get to that same amount of lightheartedness that you have in Volumes 1 and 2. Because 4 and 5 are pretty, like... They're not, like, as tragic as the second half of 3, but they're not, like... They're not super fun or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron? Yeah, I don't know that there's a way they could have done it where people would not have been mad or dropped the show. Like, I think I think it kind of did become something very different, and I don't think that's a bad thing in itself. Um, I think actually most shows do this, honestly. Like, a lot of shows go through transformations. Um, but I think if you were in it for something more lighthearted then like of course this was kind of going to be your your drop off point because it does start to like get heavy and it starts to tackle some serious topics and um i think if you're not here for that then that makes sense yeah but i think it's kind of like inevitable like it was going to it was going to go from something light to dark like you are going to just lose people no matter how you do it I think the one thing that I always wonder about with this show is that there are a lot of shows that have that transition where over time, or a lot of series where they slowly get more and more serious. Um, like, I hate to bring this up, but like Harry Potter does that, where the the books like age up with their audience. Or mm-hmm. like, I don't know, I remember, <laughs> this, this has been a long time since I've watched this, but I remember like Glee started off a lot Oh funny. my god. Started a, a, a lot funnier, and then, like, around, I remember season three, it just went straight melodrama, which was when I stopped watching. Um, I also stopped watching around three or four. Um, but, like, uh, yeah, like, that's not uncommon for shows to just slowly get more dramatic as time goes on. The thing that I feel like makes Ruby unusual is that it really is just, like, zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah. It just isn't, and then it is. It's the gif of the guy from Final Fantasy XIV laughing really hard and then getting really serious. Yeah. And I'm. Yeah, and I think if we had had more instances of like the season two finale where obviously, you know, there's a bunch of shit going on and whatever, like if we had more of that, then maybe it would not have felt so zero to 100. But like, they they just don't have time. Like, so many problems in the show, and there, I mean, obviously, are many. But so many of them come down to the fact that they don't have time and they, they, especially early on, I mean, not even up to like volume five, like they don't know how to utilize it correctly sometimes. So yeah, it's very, it's very weird. They're short on time, but the time they do have, they don't always use correctly. Exactly. So I don't think we can always excuse them that way. No, yeah, I, 100%. I mean, like thinking about, I mean, again, the biggest point of comparison for Pyrrha and Penny dying is uh, Nina and Hughes in Full Metal Alchemist. But in Full Metal Alchemist, that show opens with them trying to revive their dead mom and creating an eldritch horror. So even <laughs> when these, like, terrible, heartbreaking things happen, you're like, okay, like, you already knew this was a show that had the potential to go to some pretty dark places. So it doesn't, like, feel quite as jarring in that same way. Um, and Ruby doesn't really have stuff like that. Um, I also wonder, you just made me think of something, but I also wonder if a lot of it is due to the fact that, like, a lot of the tone of Ruby is driven by Ruby, and she is just, like, an endlessly optimistic character. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I don't think this accounts for everything, obviously, but I just, I was just thinking about that. I just think it's interesting how, like, it is, it is lighter in a lot of places, like, also because that is how she is viewing things. Like, that's what we are seeing. And so I think even in that case, like a tonal shift, and when you go from Ruby, who is like, everything's going to work out, like, blah, 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 it's going to be okay, et cetera. And then it goes to like, oh, two people are dead. And um, the world is on fire, basically. It's like a very, even more sudden, because you're kind of experiencing a singular tone from like, not just of the show, but of like a character. And then it does basically like a complete 180. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that is, that is an interesting point to bring up. Is like, yeah, Ruby is the perspective character for all of this. And I can kind of see that, but hmm. I, I still have my hangouts of like, they they probably could have eased us into this a little bit more. <laughs> um, Wish Definitely. and or Rio, uh, you were watching this all unfold in real time. Uh, how, you have yeah. thoughts on this uh, transition? I mean, I have thoughts, but they're kind of opposite of what everyone else has to say as per usual. <laughs> but, Love it. Um, I feel like anybody who did not watch the trailers feels the way that you guys feel because it started out as a very lighthearted show 
and then it just felt like a zero to 100 really quick. But as for the people who started the show as like watching the first red trailer and then the first episode of the show hitting and it was completely different from what you expected it to be was disappointing. It was like, Mm. "Uh, I don't know if I'm going to watch this show because I was expecting something a little deeper from what this is. So when it did actually hit this point in the show, it went from I was watching the show for the plot and the plot being like Pira or Coco Adele to like <laughs> there's actually plot in the show. That's a really like, good point. The point. Yeah. 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 Like I feel like it is jarring for a lot of people who definitely didn't see the trailers until later on, but like for everybody else it's not super jarring. It's just like shocking that they killed off two people in one season. And but not necessarily the tonal shift shock. If if you're anything like me and them, um, you would have also listened to the volume of soundtracks and like hyper analyzed the music. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the music ah. is really dark. <laughs> That's so, true. Like, that gonna come in. A lot of yeah. music That's is true. The music the is so edgy. Really dark. Yeah. For the That's season. True. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't considering like the trailers, and I was like just thinking from like the volume perspective. But I do think if you add in the trailers, you're right. Yeah, I I definitely get that. I mean, I'm someone who didn't watch the trailers until like a month ago after being obsessed with the show for like two to three years. So, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, that would make sense. It's like if you weren't obsessing over the trailers and especially the soundtracks, which I also wasn't paying super close attention to. Yeah, I guess if you're looking at it from that perspective as like a holistic, like multi- like part experience you could see some hints of like hmm like they're hinting at something darker here um i just think that could have been a lot better communicated in the text itself yeah Yeah, i feel like the first two volumes could have been a little darker just to like ease the shift but i mean i just felt that way from the beginning because it was already kind of disappointing to me after seeing the trailers but i just held on and was like hoping for the real shit to start happening and then it did and then now i'm stuck on the show for like the rest of my life and so. now it has you <laughs> ruby yes, never decides to end <laughs> it- yeah this show has a chokehold on me i'll be honest we're here forever it's like i said it's a, it's a fucking sorority you got to get through the hazing and then you're stuck in it for the rest of your life yep okay uh we have to talk about the sad stuff now hmm yeah Okay. okay, where to start on this? So, Monty Um tragically passed away in between volumes two and three. Everyone was heartbroken about this. The crew was heartbroken. The fans were heartbroken. He was pretty much universally beloved among like anyone with any kind of investment in the show. And the unfortunate thing about this is that while this should just be sort of this like universal human experience of just mourning this person whose work you loved and who meant so much to so many people, it was kind of inevitable also that this was going to cause problems within the fandom. Because now you have a show that has lost the driving force behind it that is still going. And anytime something like that happens, there is going to be a divide among the fans. Mm -hmm. Um... The, the divide amongst the fan base was really exacerbated by the existence of an open letter to those who cherished, cherished or treasured Monty Um, The open letter from Shane Newville, one of the lead animators on the show for volumes one and two, and I think some of volume three. Um, those of you who were around when this dropped, because this was... I came in way after this, and Maria came in way after this. Um, do you want to talk a bit about, like, what this did to people and what this was? This tore people apart. Um, yeah. So, I specifically remember one of the friends who basically sort of showed me the trailers, um, they were devastated. And then when they read the letter, they were like, I don't know if I can support the show anymore. And I was like, well, why don't we just wait and see what happens? And then when volume four rolled around, it kind of sort of looked like what the letter was saying was true for some of it. So they like completely dropped the show. Um, and then, it, yeah, there's just, there's so much in there that like, it seemed like not only toward the, like the fans part, but it tore a lot of the people working at Rooster Teeth apart. 
Um, if anyone else wants to pick up there, I'm having trouble collecting my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I remember this really well. I had the opposite experience. Like I actually, I knew a lot of people who were, didn't really know what to make of it. But I actually ended up, like most of you I knew ended up finding it just in the end, not believable and like pretty unprofessional, which I actually do agree with that. Like it was an incredibly unprofessional letter to the point that he was blaming like his his divorce on the show and all like a lot of things that were really not related. Like there were some weird things in that letter. It did, um, seem, it did seem like he was having like a, a little bit of like a depressive break. Yeah, he was day. having like a lot of problems. And I yeah. think a lot of it ended up coming out in that letter and plenty of people. I mean, you know, there were people who were literally reading that and posting like an, like analyses of that letter and being like, here's a line that doesn't make any sense and he's contradicting himself and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a weird time in the fandom. It was like people were very, did not know what to do. But one of the things, one of the things at the time I found interesting, now we know some of like, obviously they had issues with like their labor and and that that was accurate. As a but, company. As yeah, a company, it was, it was yes. Like, yeah. As a company. So that part is true. But the thing that I actually did find interesting, and I think this is a testament to, you know, the company itself, like the personalities, people who work on it, how transparent they are, that so many people just literally did not, didn't, like, went to bat for that show and for the people working on it. Like, people were so passionate on both sides of this about doing kind of the right thing. It was, like, really interesting. I've actually never seen something like that in a fandom before. I think, and this is probably going to be slightly controversial, but I, I, I think it's also true. Um, there, Shane did list a lot of, you know, ideas that Monty had or he wanted to do or et cetera, et cetera, that things that did not obviously get done. Um, and honestly, some of them weren't good. And I, I think like anybody who creates anything knows that just because you have an idea doesn't mean it is ultimately the best idea. And obviously, like there are many drafts of ideas before ultimately you pick something that works and that with the story or whatever you're creating. Um, and like, I think for what volume three is like they overall, I think they did do a really good job. And um, I don't think Monty just being the creator and because he died, that makes him like infallible, I guess in that way, in a creative way. Yeah. Like I, I believe everybody did the best they could at that time with what they had. And so I kind of am not into the criticism that it's like just because they didn't do his idea means that the show was like they were wrong or the show was bad. Like I, I just think it's a lot more complicated than that. Like a lot of it boiled down to people like we have to respect Monty's legacy and do exactly what he wanted like done and the other people were like well he also trusted miles and carrie to write with him and fix mm -hmm. things and revise yeah. things for better or for worse like that's just what it was and then it shane was very much of the uh the mindset of it has to be exact it has to be this vision exactly and when it didn't happen that way he's and with everything else that was happening around him he just sort of had like started to break down about it i guess it that's mm -hmm. what it seemed like in the letter yeah but, Something that's... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, like, I yeah, there were just, like, I mean, there were so many complicated elements to that letter, including, like, things I, I don't even think we should honestly touch on, like, but... I don't know. I don't know if we want to talk about Monty's wife, because... Yeah, I that's what I was going to say, is I don't, yeah. think even, oh, I don't think we should even touch God. on that. God. But I, there were just a lot of very complicated elements that, that were very emotional things that I think kind of forced people to take a side on something that I actually don't think people should have taken a side on. Like, I actually don't really think we should have been involved in this, like as viewers. You know I what I mean? Like, I- I'm sorry, go on. No, that's, that's it. I was saying, like, I, I thought it was an unprofessional letter at the time. I thought a lot of it was due to his personal breakdowns and a lot of it should not have been published. Exactly. Yeah, it seemed like he was grieving and in that stage of like being really angry yeah. about things and just kind of like publicly posted what he was personally feeling but yeah. I don't think it should have been posted for the world to see yeah I think he wanted to assign a lot of blame and this is the only way yeah. he, he could do it and I I don't necessarily agree with that the things about like the company I guess were okay like to bring to light but like I just 
it, it definitely could have been handled more professionally. And then the fact that this letter like drove a lot of people to be like, well, I can't support the company and I don't want to watch the show. But like, I feel like the best way to sort of respect Monty would be to actually keep enjoying the show. Yeah. In my opinion. But that's yeah, like me. again, like these are people that he trusted to take care of his show. He had clearly been working with them for a while now. They knew so much. They had had, I mean, they had endless discussions about it. Like, I. I trust that, you know, like I, I, there wasn't a moment where I was like, I'm not going to trust these people that Monty trusted for so long. Like, yeah, it was never just a Monty thing. Like yeah. these people have been involved since the beginning. Exactly. The, I, there's a lot to unpack in this letter. There's a couple things that kind of stick out to me as like things that have shaped the way the fandom um, has behaved ever since this. One thing I think about a lot is like how, like sometimes like an it, when an artist dies young it changes the way we discuss their work like mm -hmm. every so often people don't like having these conversations because it's a great way to get booed off the stage and have you know uh, rotten fruit thrown at you but every so often someone within like the hip-hop community will be like hey how much of biggie and tupac being the greatest rappers of all time is because they both died young every right. so often someone will approach that and with Monty, if you go back, if you go way back into the archives and look at criticism of Ruby from before volume three, people are very harsh on Monty. They, yeah. they blame yeah. Monty for the show's problems in the same way that people blame every issue they have with Steven Universe on Rebecca Sugar or people blame, you know, every bad balance patch on Jeff from the Overwatch team. Like as the face of the show, as the dude who's in the created by credit on every episode, like, he bore the brunt of the responsibility for all of the highs and lows of this show. And I think there's, like, any time you have a situation like that, there's always going to be criticism that's very unreasonable and is, you know, sort of more wrapped up in, like, the, the critic than the actual text. But mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of validity to that of like, hey, like you're in charge of this project. You have final say over what gets published. So like, like you bear responsibility for like, like all of the best and worst parts of it. And even just looking at like the specific details of, you know, people talking about like what Monty was pushing for, you know, he had his hands in like a lot of the best and the worst parts of Ruby. He was the one pushing for more screen time for Jean because he just really liked Jean. Um, you know, he was the one who would like throw in a lot of stuff very last minute that Miles and Carrie, who had like no writing experience, then had to somehow make click with the rest of the story. There mm -hmm. was lots of valid criticism of Monty, but, you know, out of respect for his legacy, people don't want to bring that up, which is understandable. I get it. I don't want to like, you know... <laughs> you know, go after people for not criticizing this guy who, you know, died a few months ago at that point. But the unfortunate side effect of that is that you get this position where, like, a common opinion to have is basically Monty good, Miles and Carrie bad. Yes. Everything Monty, yeah. Everything Monty did was great and infallible, and any mm. bad parts of the show have to be Miles and Carrie's fault. And if you start thinking like that, well, volume four onward have to be shit, like, legally, because Miles and Carrie are bad, and Monty was the only good thing the show had going for it. And the Shane Newville letter just fed into that so hard, because he really admired and looked up to Monty so much, because Monty, like, got him into the... He got his foot in the door, and he... Yeah, he was, like, a mentor. Yeah, they worked super closely together. They were really good friends. I understand why he thought that way. But, like, yeah, it, it just really fed into, like sort of this really bad instinct in the fandom. And then the thing that really pisses me off, and I promised people the bass-boosted Soviet anthem uh, uh, lecture, but there really isn't that much to say here. Just mm -hmm. the fact that, like, there were, like, some serious labor abuses going on in Rooster Teeth. And if Shane mm -hmm. had dropped a letter about that specifically, like, that would have been... A really good thing because I think like as fans like Rooster Teeth has indicated and especially Miles and Carrie that like they do listen to their fans and they take what we say seriously and mm -hmm. if there was a massive fan outcry regarding the way that they treat you know their animators and their independent contractors like 
like it would have been a rare instance of like the fans actually pressuring the company into doing something good for a change. Like, and I would have really loved to see that, but you know, he didn't say Rooster Teeth has shit labor practices. He said, this isn't what Monty would have wanted. And also they fired me for dumb reasons. And like, he knew what would have been more incendiary to the fan base. Like exactly. people know how this operates. And it just, it made it so that like that shit didn't get addressed until volume six. And it could have been a real topic of discussion that actually united people as opposed to divided them so much sooner. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to say that he's, like, a bad dude or anything, because he definitely just did that out of, like, sadness and anger. But, like, it, he definitely did cause, like, more of an issue in the long run with the show. So, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, he wrapped up a lot of other people. I mean, he just wrapped up so many people in this that, you know, I don't know if anybody, like, I'm sure you guys, were, do you guys if you remember that day in the fandom, but, like, I remember just watching, like, the cast and crew, like, posting on social media and being unable to actually talk about it. Like, I remember, yeah. like, them, their Instagram posts and their Snapchats and them just being, like, literally, so, obviously so fucked up over this, but unable to do anything. A like, there was... We're, like, really hurt and betrayed, and a lot of them yeah. were, like, how could you undermine the fact that, like, how we felt about Monty and that yeah. yeah. Like, that's the thing, is, like, they, they all knew Monty, and they all loved Monty. Like, it wasn't, like, Shane's letter was very, almost, like, possessive of him. Yes. And it was, it was very uncomfortable, because it's, like... You know, he didn't have ownership over this person or this product. Like, I mean, this um, show, like many people at that company loved Monty and they considered him like one of their closest friends. Like, it, so there's just a lot that I think could have been addressed a lot better than it was. Absolutely. I think the last. Leo. Sorry. Sorry. Do you remember the, do you remember the candle vigil that's held at Katsukon for Monty and how like people were upset? during that too and like fighting about it during that too oh, oh yeah i remember God. that sadly uh katsukan takes place in february which i believe is around the time that um monty actually did die um so there's like usually a candle vigil there um i don't think there's been one for a couple years but the first and second year that it happened there were like pretty much literal fights that broke out during it so like <laughs> christ yeah, this should have been something that I think, like, again, I think a certain amount of discourse was inevitable, but this just made it so much worse than it needed yeah. to be. I think the last piece of this that is a, a sort of open wound in the fandom is the whole concept of what Monty would have wanted. Oh, gosh. This has become a debate that has been so uh, overwrought that it's almost a meme at this point. Fun fact, on r slash Ruby, the official Ruby subreddit, they have a rule against the Monty argument. If you say huh. this, is what Mon this isn't what Monty would have wanted, you just get banned. <laughs> it's because Incredible. it's so Yeah, it's so disrespectful. Uh, none of That's us become, know like, more common. What he would have wanted. Like, yeah. it's just... It's like the audacity people even say, like, none of, none of you knew him. Like, none of you. Like, I don't know. Yeah, none of us viewers that. have the right to make that claim. Yeah, like, you cannot say shit. Like, oh my god. It drives me crazy. Gets, the thing that gets me, though, is that people will use it to justify their arguments about something that doesn't even matter. Like, yes. shipping. Oh, like, yes. Know, like, <laughs> Monty wouldn't have wanted this. And it'll happen, like, with anything in the show. Anything. They use and it for everything. something small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad we're all in agreement on that. That's like, we're all just yeah. so sick of that argument. It's so stupid. It's, it's a horrible argument. It's so disrespectful. Yeah. Like, don't, don't drag him into this. Let him rest. Yeah. All right, last point of discourse before we wrap oh. up this monster oh, yeah, of an go. episode. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm rolling up my sleeves. Queer... I'm rolling up my... <laughs> Mine are already rolled up. <laughs> queer baiting. Uh, so, okay. I feel like this was another thing where it was almost inevitable in the sense that from pretty early on, this show attracted like a large LGBT audience and mm -hmm. people from very early on were really wrapped up in shipping. So it was only a matter of time before people start throwing around queer baiting as an accusation. Um, I was, okay, I came into this fandom when like the relationships were a little bit further along and maybe I just was smart about who I followed because I didn't see a lot of this but I'm assuming that you guys saw a lot of it so you oh, want to yeah I still get asked on tumblr to this day from people who are like bumblebee's queer baiting 
Like I could probably yep. go on my Tumblr right now and have an ask, and it's probably about that. I mean, I feel that. Yeah, as like, a cosplayer of like both oh, Yen yeah. and occasionally Blake, like people will walk up to me and look me dead in the eyes and be like, "Oh, like I hope you don't like Bumblebee because they're definitely queer baiting." <laughs> like, bro, Christ. I'm just trying to have fun, ma'am. This is I, a Wendy's. Yeah, <laughs> and it's what? like. People said that so much, like when at Volume Threes, they were like, "Oh, Bumblebee is queer baiting." Like, I just the arguments, like these. This was like the main argument all the time. Is that like we would sit there and be like, "If this is queer baiting, they would like they. This is also purposeful. This is not queer baiting. They did all of this on purpose, like in a way where it is going to become something. It is clearly a central theme." I and other people would be like, "No." I wanted to believe that it wasn't curve baiting, but because I had heard it so much, I was like, oh god, what if they are? What if they are? And I was so nervous about it until, like, like I, I want to say until, like, volume five. And I was like, oh, all right, it's, everything's good. But, like... Oh my god, so I held so fast. I was like, nope, it's not. I was like, this is all done. I, I actually did, I never had a moment where I was like, this is great. Because probably because I got into the show on the specific idea that this is gay. Like... <laughs> So I always yeah. came in and I was like, it's gay. And that's it. And I'm going to hold that ground. I'm going to die on this hill. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, it worked out in my favor. But yeah, we used to have like many an argument. Oh, my God. I think I I kind of see. I don't know. I've always been like uh, some, And maybe this is just the straight in me showing. But the fact that like I've always had a lot harder time recognizing when people are going to like throw around queer baiting. There are times when it's like really obvious. Like there's some like idle anime I watch where like the there's oh, an yeah. arbitrary rule in place that says that no couples are allowed to be canon, but they'll do everything they can up to that point to where it's like almost kind of ridiculous um and so like i'm familiar with like that where they make it like really obvious but there are other times where yeah like some of this stuff is just like yeah it's just you know girls being friends gals being pals you know just because you see the queer bait just because you see like you know subtext there doesn't mean it's necessarily there yeah um, so like, part of the problem is like people don't even know what queer baiting is like they just throw that word around whenever yeah. there's like a gay ship at this point yes but like yeah queer baiting is a specific it's a specific malicious act that occurs when like a writer a promoter or whatever are highlighting a same sex, et cetera, LGBTQ, queer, whatever, couple in a way that is subtextually supposed to be read as romantic. And they are doing this in order to draw in viewers or whatever. Like they are doing it for a reason. Like it is not just like you like these two characters together and you think that they are gay and then they are not. Like that's not what queer yeah. reading is. So people, and people like really don't get that. So that was the, that was one of the other reasons. Actually, that's actually one of the reasons I thought I was so convinced this was not queer baiting is because it was such a big argument at the time, and it was it was obviously something that the crew and cast saw occurring, and it was never clarified. And at that mm. time, they were in such a precarious position, um, like just kind of with their image, that I was like, if this is something that is going to be a huge issue, I'm gonna expect that they're going to address it. Because otherwise, like, it's going to be a problem. Like, if they continue down this path of basically highlighting this couple in, like, tweets or et cetera, but then not going anywhere, like, yes, that would be queer baiting. And then, obviously, it's not. But so, uh, yeah, so queer baiting is not just, like, you like two characters who are gay and they don't get together or are not gay or whatever. Like, that's not what that is. Yeah. We'll have this whole discussion all over again in Volume 7. Um, oh, can't wait. But, oh, that'll be a fun Love episode. <laughs> Oh, man. Mm. All right. Let's wrap this up very nicely. We're already running long. Um, final thoughts on this volume, uh, Maria. This is one of the strongest volumes, um, even just not just even so far in terms of like out of all of the volumes. This is one of the strongest. This is one of the most memorable. Um, you know, it's not without its faults. It's not without its discourse, but we finally reached the point where like the show is actually starting to pay off and that feels really good Aaron. um yeah like i i basically agree i think um this was just an overall pretty solid volume um i really like the shift in tone um because it's what i went in expecting um uh i think this is where you see that the show's getting serious um and it's willing to tackle like darker mature topics in 
try and do a pretty good job of them. And so up there, yeah, again, I think it's one of the stronger ones. Uh, Rio? Um, pretty much what everyone said. Uh, I want to point out that the pacing is very good compared to the past seasons. Oh my god, I forgot and to talk about really that. it's also really good by itself. Like a standalone volume, you could definitely just show someone this volume and they could go forward from there and not really need to watch volume one or two. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's one of the best seasons, if not the best season. I can almost see that, but I'm also one of those people who are like, no, you're not allowed to skip Phantom Blood. I don't care how boring it is. <laughs> like, you have. I, feel like I feel you. Like, I think they should watch it, but like, if you absolutely don't want to, then you don't have to. Yeah. If you That's true. The animation turns off. a lot of people off. Yeah. If you think you're going to turn off by one and two, show them three, and then be like, now you go back and you watch the trash. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how I got like into the show is I saw youtube ads for volume five i was like huh it looks like they really uh turned it out after a mm. while like maybe this is worth sticking through and uh you know now i'm obsessed with it and i can't stop recommending this bad show to people <laughs> <laughs> yep uh wish yep this volume um for me slaps it's one of my favorite volumes um and I did. I I was one of the people who really liked the shift in tone because um, I tend to lean towards more darker tone shows to begin with, um, and like I I definitely think that this is where it starts to pick up speed. There's definitely like the pacing good compared to like previous volumes and even some of the newer volumes. The pacing is in volume three is like very very good in comparison. Agreed. Speaking of pacing, I'm sure that we will have quite a bit to talk about when it comes to pacing on the next episode. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching and or listening. I hope you have enjoyed. This one ran a little longer, but it's volume three. What do you fucking expect? This is the one where everyone has the most feelings. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. The and, podcast uh, length uh, be longer than the volume itself. Uh, actually, no, because volume three <laughs> is like almost uh, three hours so it's close, but not quite. Oh, yeah. It's a I little... I know after editing. The volumes... Get... Oh, Christ. All right. Thank you all so much <laughs> for watching. And uh, yeah, see you whenever the next episode goes up. Bye. 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 Bye.